OCB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Half past seven on this Tuesday morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Owen and Shane Hannan with you for the morning. We'll be with you right the way through until 10 o'clock and plenty happening this morning. We're going to have Mickey Quinn with us to talk about Kilo Emmett Oaks. Return to action, really, after their 48-week ban was overturned by the DRA at the weekend. Matt Williams will be joining us to chat about the Pro 14 ahead of the final this weekend. Seni Naupu will be with us later on as well to chat about a fairly incredible year in her life, uh, a couple of health issues that she's had to go through and her return to rugby, which is hopefully coming up later this year. And Stephen Doyle will be going through Deal or No Deal and a few last takes, I'd imagine, as well on Stephen Kenny's first couple of games as Ireland manager. But first, we are sticking with that story. Here is Kevin Doyle on last night's show reacting to Stephen Kenny's first couple of games as Ireland boss. All in all, a frustrating couple of games in Stephen Kenny's first week in charge, coupled with that one-all draw over in Bulgaria. To reflect on it all, I'm joined on the line by the former Republic of Ireland striker Kevin Doyle. Evening, Kevin. Evening, Nathan. How are you? Considering that the players had, what, two, three training sessions at most, and they've all said that, essentially, fitness-wise, they're in pre-season mode, could we have expected much more last night? No, I'm surprised people are so so surprised, to be honest. I don't right. know what, what you expect. It's a bit, it's glorified, friendly game. I know it's the Nations League, but it's, it's now treat them as friendly games, looking at them. Um, settling in, you know, it's, it's it was Stephen Kenny's uh, first time under so much pressure, under so much spotlight. I think he performed very well himself. I think he handled himself well. He spoke well. I don't know what people he gave he gave lads their debut. Um, he's trying to implement a, a different style of play, um, and you know everyone just getting used to being around new coaches, new manager. Yeah, we could have won the games easily, and we also could have lost. I think could have lost both of them. We easily won both of them. Um, I think it was fine. Nothing to panic about. Nothing to get too excited about, but nothing to be too downbeat about. I think he he needs plenty of time, patience. Um, you know, some young players coming through and, and we're glad he gave them a chance as well. He mm. could have easily just, you know, just you know, gone with the experienced players and not give them their their time. I think they performed well. Connolly, I thought, looked good. I think Adamida looked good. Um, Malumbi looked good at, at times. So, well, no, I'd be positive enough about it. I guess the concern is that there's almost two different strands to this conversation. There's the long-term plan and the mm. evolution that Stephen Kenny wants to bring in terms of tactics and and how we look at Irish football in a more possession-based game and there's the short-term aspect of Slovakia in yeah. a month's time in a Euro 2020 playoff with home games to come potentially in Dublin next summer and the importance of that and whether too much has been thrown at the players too early in terms of a new system and, and how uneasy a lot of the players seemed in that 4-3-3 system and, and even the strengths of the old brigade, that defensively, a side that had let in, what, five goals in eight matches during the last qualifiers, suddenly looked really open. The pitch looked very, very big when Ireland lost the ball. And how he can correct that in the space of probably two more training sessions. So just, so just to take it on the short term, yeah. and looking at Slovakia, would there be concerns around that, that actually there, there's too much of a overhaul too quickly here? Um... Of course there's concerns. You know, you're talking about the back four. That would be my one, I suppose, worry. Um, you know, we've gone from a back four who are used to defending deep and are solid, and it's great to be a defender for Ireland if you're that type of defender. You sit back and you just head and clear and boot it up the pitch, and that's changed. You know, Stephen wants him pressing, pushing high up the pitch. Um, and and, that, and that, that has to be a real concern because the one thing yeah. we had was we felt we were very good defensively, but were Ireland very strong defensively because actually all they had to do was sit back and defend? They didn't have to really think about it. Like, how many times did we say yeah. Shane Duffy with that heroic last gas yeah. performance? Now they have to think a little bit more. Well, it is. It's playing to, it was playing to our strengths in a way. You know, everyone behind the ball, and, and for a centre-half who likes to head it and kick it, for in, in Shane's case, I think that's maybe doing a bit of an injustice. Mm. He struggled in the two games a little bit, but he also scored an important goal, but... He is a guy, his frame, his type of body, he needs fitness, he needs games. He hasn't had it, he hasn't had it near the end of last season with Brighton. He's gone on loan to Celtic, he'll get plenty of games. For him, he was the one who me to me who looked like he needed time on the pitch. And he'll have that hopefully by the time we play Slovakia, he'll have plenty plenty of games. He needs a bit of confidence. The way we play with Ireland now under Stephen Kenny, it looks like the way we're gonna play, he's gonna be higher on the pitch. He's gonna have a lot more responsibility on the ball. You know, his responsibility was last ditch tackles, headers, blocks. Now he's going to be on the ball. We saw him on the ball a lot, and he looked a little bit cagey and a little bit nervous, but he has to 
overcome that and he is actually good on the ball I've played with him before I've seen him if he has a bit of confidence in himself and plays a few games and gets used to that role with Ireland he's used to being the sort of superhero block everything you know get everyone in behind him helping him out and he, he can't play like that now and he you know as a, as a top player he ha- he should be able to do that and I think he can and John Egan seem more comfortable um, but again it's a little bit of a change back four that was strong together but I think I think with games under their belt um, with their clubs they'll look better for it um, and especially especially Shane Duffy um, but other than that you know, there was positives to take from it. You know, everyone's gone about our possession stats over the years mm. and we, we had plenty of that. And um, It just takes a bit of time. Um, and we've said it all along, Stephen needs time. But um, as he said, if we were to worry about the Slovakia game so much, we'd still have Mick McCarthy in charge. I know it's a massive game, but if we were thinking about short term, you'd leave Mick in charge and let him get the job done. And we have to, Stephen has to balance that. And, you know, he's come in, he's in his first game. I, you know, I, I, I don't think there was... I don't think there was as many negatives as maybe thing people think. Just in terms of the player's fitness and how big an impact that has. So this is in the 80s or 90s. And maybe some of the expectation was because I think Stephen Kenny played it down in terms of where the player's fitness would be. The fact that Matt Doherty had been on holidays for three weeks. Yeah. That you're not coming back a stone overweight anymore. Jeff Hendrick hasn't played a game in six months before Bulgaria. And he's still in unbelievable physical shape. But John Egan looked out on his feet after an hour yesterday. When, the, when they cleared the yeah. ball, he's almost down. His hunker is just looking shattered. In terms of trying to actually think on the pitch, and I'm sure you've been in that position where you're playing games, first match of the season, and, and things aren't right. J- just how big an impact does it have on a player not being 100%? Yeah, you know, it's your rhythm. You know, you need to get into a rhythm again. I know they haven't had a long time off, but they had a long break and they played a few games at the end of the season. Um, and they're back again a few weeks off. It just gets you out of your rhythm. Um, especially, you know, I always felt big centre halves, which we have, uh, take longer to get fit. I know that mightn't be as case as much as it was in the past, but they're, they're big frames, big bodies, their feet, they need to work on their movement and their feet and their, their touch. I just think they need a bit more than maybe a, a Matt Doherty or a Seamus Coleman or, you know, guys in midfield or front who are lighter on their feet and they're more naturally better movement and fitness anyway. So, um, that'll come for those two lads and again they've played for Ireland as I said I'm repeating myself but they've played a different way for Ireland centre half mm. for Ireland were always you know our best players because of the way we played in a sense as well block everything be a sort of you know a superhero at the back and, and, and you didn't have to worry about too much about the football side of things and, and they have to think a bit more now um, that'll take a few games I hope um, you know as I said they play for their clubs and they play for their clubs they're on the ball plenty of times uh, Shane Duffy didn't play for Brighton near the end of the season and that would have taken its toll on his body as well uh, he doesn't have match fitness he didn't have it from the end of last season to bring into you know only three weeks off he couldn't bring it into this season if he didn't have it from last season so he will play plenty of times for Celtic and he'll get confidence playing for Celtic they'll be winning games and he'll be on the ball a lot more and a lot more used to being in possession um, which he's going to have to be if he's going to be playing and, and starting for Ireland um, fitness is key for him recovery runs high up the pitch Ireland are pressing now it looks like they're going to be pressing higher up the pitch mm. which I'm delighted with um, but that puts a bigger onus on centre half turning, quick feet, getting back, recovering. Full backs, Matt Doherty had to probably stay a bit further back than he would have liked because he has to stay back when when, when the centre halves and, and everyone's pushed so high, they have to have protection and cover. And he would have been curtailed attacking wise because of that. He would have been held back to to help cover his centre half. But that's listen, something that he'll have to get used to too. He's a fifteen million pound player now. He's playing for a top club. He he should be able to adjust to different ways. Jose Mourinho will have him tucking in and, and been more defensive minded than he was at Wolves that's for certain so um, again he'll be he'll be better for that in, in, a, in a couple of months as well In both matches even though the performance in Bulgaria was, was better but in both games when Ireland lost the ball even deep inside the opposition half they looked really vulnerable on the counter attack and, and Kenny Cunningham mm. was on this morning saying that he doesn't get the correlation between having a high line and more expansive football and how one means that one is at risk that even if you play a high line it's how you react when you lose the ball and that you need to turn as you say turn your body quicker and get back quicker is that something that can be fixed quite quickly or do you actually Ireland need to change things for the next month and maybe not press quite as high not commit as many men as far forward yeah in a massive game against Slovakia he mightn't be as committed in these you know treating these ones as a learning curve he he was letting them you know see how it goes he'll watch these game back and, and take I'm sure um, learn stuff from that as well and maybe realise maybe I can't have Shane Duffy and, and John Egan press quite as high in such a high line and, and they'll learn from that and 
Um, the management will learn from that. They might say, listen, lads, drop an extra five yards there. We don't want to be quite as high. Little, little details that make a big difference. Mm. And again, I go back to their maybe centre half lack of fitness and, and again, not used to playing like that for Ireland. Um, but uh, it does. We are, I know you're saying, Kenny said it, one thing doesn't lead to another. I, I think it does. When you are pressing higher and you're winning the ball higher up the pitch, it means you're, you're, you're leaving more space behind more, you know, players are further up the pitch. You don't, your center half don't have that cover, that insurance yeah. of a midfielder sitting in front of them. So it does lead to the other thing, but you have to get the balance right. If we're to be a more attacking team, have more of the ball, we have to, you know, commit players forward, win the ball higher up the pitch, um, be more attack and threat. And it will lead to us maybe being open more defensively, but we have good defenders who should be, um, when they're 100% fit, should be able to deal with it. I hope, I hope they will be able to. Um, I really like Shindofi. I think he's a very good defender, but, I just felt he was lacking half a yard, which is a lot to him. You know, big guy like him, half a yard makes a big difference. Um, the difference maybe between uh, one of those goals going in and out. He was at fault for one of those goals, I think. And then in a, on a better day when he'd be fully fit, that wouldn't have happened. And pressing high up the pitch as well, I guess that's where the energy and the fitness comes into it. It's not just about the back four. It'd be unfair to compare what Ireland may do with what Liverpool do. But Liverpool are the team probably with the highest press almost in European football right into the opposition half. And an awful lot comes on to the front three and the energy of the midfield of that when you do lose the ball, that you don't give the opposition team time to actually pick out a pass, that they're under so much pressure, all they can do is hoof it forward. Did you see signs of a high press there? Did you see enough signs that Ireland are going to be able, when everyone is fit, to put enough pressure on opposition centre back so they, they can't just stroll through the middle quite as easily? Yeah, I think I think over the years it would have suited us a lot more to have that high press. We had so many players with so much energy. I was I was desperate. I hated every game. You know, it's, it's understandable against the likes of Spain where you sit back and you can't press them too high because they will pick you up. But majority of international teams, you can press them high up if you're organised enough. And that's one, play, to, to be organised and do a high press, everyone has to be on the same page. The players really need to know what each one is doing. You can't have one going off on a tangent. Um, and that's the case of training two or three days together. He wouldn't have been able to organise that as well as he's liked, I'm sure. But we do have young, fresh legs with plenty of energy in them who can do that job. And, you know... You can. It's you don't need massive skill to press high. You just need to be organised. And when you do win the ball back high up the pitch, it saves us an awful lot of trouble because we don't have the most creative midfield in the world to break teams down with fantastic passes or whatever it might be. So if we can win the ball high up the pitch, it solves a little bit of a problem for ourselves. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to score a goal if you're winning it in the opposition's final third. So um, listen, I think it's a, it'll suit us once we get it bedded down and everyone knows their role and job I, and um, we don't panic into thinking, right, this didn't go our way. I don't think mm. Stephen will. He's he's quite level-headed and, and uh, seems to come across after the games like he was very happy with things, uh, you know, and, and, and carry this on and everyone can be on the same page for, for a number of months instead of, you know, going, right, that didn't work and we throw everything out and we, we go back to... Um, what we've done over the years, I think it suits us. I hope we stick at it, and I think long term we get we get uh, a lot of joy out of it. He won't have to take all the blame if things don't go right over the next few months. The old line of "we don't have the players" is being trotted out once again, and you would have heard that a lot during the latter stages of your Ireland career that the players simply aren't there. Would you have any questions around that, particularly in midfield, where over the two games he tried six different players? It's hard to think of one of them who really put their hand up saying, you know what, I've got to start yeah. next month. Would you have any concerns from what you've seen of if he wants to stick with this 4-3-3 formation, that maybe right now Ireland don't have the skill set in midfield to play that that style? No, I think it's crap that we don't have the players. It's such an easy thing to say. Our own managers have been saying it the last few years um, when things don't go their way. Um, I think that's just the easy answer. Did Finland have the players the other night? Did mm. Bulgaria? What, what's the difference between any of our players? Most of our players, the majority are either playing the Premier League or top championship clubs. Um, we have the players. They mightn't be playing for Man United or they mightn't be playing for Man City, but the majority of them are playing at high level, as high level as any team in, in Europe, apart from the Spains and the Italys and the Germanys. And we, we never had, you know, Spain, Italy and Germany type top world-class players. Robbie Keane, the last year, Damien Duff, we had the odd one. But in the majority of cases, we're as good as any international team. You know, the 90% of the international teams, as I said, Slovakia, who have they got that's any different to us? So that's that's an easy one to pull out. Um, uh, I don't agree with all. A well-organised international team, majority of players playing a top division should be able to go out and play well and win games. Um, you know, if you don't have any superstars, either do most international teams, to be honest with you. So... Um, 
No, that's an easy one to, to throw out there, and I don't agree with it. It's funny how you get a different sense, maybe at times when you're at the game. I, I thought Harry Arthur brought a lot of energy to Ireland, and yeah. uh, a lot of leadership as well. Was the one guy in the last 20 minutes really trying to drive them on, and you come home and you're looking online and he's getting slated. And at times it felt actually Robbie Brady was maybe trying a bit too hard. And you'll know Robbie Brady, and geez, there's not many players yeah. who want to pull on the jersey more than, than Brady. And there was that time he took the ball off Arthur in the middle of midfield when he probably should have let Arthur drive on and pick up a better position. And Brady plays it straight out of play. And Robbie Brady gets man of the match. In terms of wanting, what, what, what do you think he wants in that midfield then for next month? Do you want the energy? of an Arthur and a Brady, or do you want the craft of a, of a James McCarthy? Or is that actually maybe your perfect midfield of three of them? Yeah. Maybe the three of them. I don't know if James has fantastic... You know, James, to me, is more of a, a, a breaker-upper and win-the-ball backer than, than a craft. You know, none of them really stand out as massive crafters. Um, they're more energy and work rate. And, win. and I think in that, in that role, that we, that's what we need, more energy on the ball. People say we need passes, we need people to break the teams down. Well, if we're playing a high press and we're winning the ball high up the pitch, maybe we don't need as as fantastic uh, um, ball playing midfielders as other teams. Uh, you know, it's all how Stephen sees it. But for me, you know, there's not much between any of those, to be honest with you. They're, none of them top, top class, um, I suppose, at trading a true ball through and setting people up. But they're all very good at work rate, very good enthusiasm decent enough on the ball and will win the ball back. So you could pick any of them. I thought Malumbi was quite good when he played, actually. Um, I don't know if he'll you know, throw him into the deep end in, in the game against uh, Slovakia, but um, Harry Archer, I thought, was full of energy. I'm delighted to see him back. It could have been so easy for him to, you know, I suppose retire from international football and move on and nothing mm. would have been said about it, but he sticks around and he's, he's a good, good player and we need him. And um, I thought he was impressive enough in, in the game, yeah. What about the front three then, uh, all of whom had moments, but again, goals are a huge issue. I put it to Stephen yeah. Kenny yesterday. Shane Duffy is the only Irish player to score more than one goal over the last three seasons. Aaron Connolly had his chances, didn't look fully confident. Adam Eda had a different role, had his back to goal a lot, and Callum O'Dowda had moments, and then you have um, McGoldrick and Robinson coming on and, and adding a little bit of energy. Would you be concerned about where the goals are going to come from and the inexperience that a lot of those players have at international level, that everything else is sorted, if we get things right defensively, that the problems were there under Mick McCarthy where it was, what, seven goals yeah. in eight qualifying matches, that, that that's going to be a huge issue over the next couple of years. Who is going to score the goals? Yeah, one of them have to, you know come forward and do it. Aaron Connolly, you know, excites me most times I see him play. I think he's got the ability to score goals. He's got quick feet and looks a really good finisher. Um, hopefully he'll get some games between now and, and Slovakia with his club. Um, he's the one for me that stands out. I thought Ida was decent at holding up and he, in that role as a nine, holding up back to play, he brought people into it. I thought for him, he had a fairly respectable couple of games. Um, you know, you could trust him with the ball, whether he's going to get you a lot of goals, I don't know. But Connolly, to me, would be the one that would stand out that might be going forward in the future. Um, we had Shane Long on the bench, didn't really get used. He's I said, our top goal scorer. Mm. Probably everyone else has added up. We'd add to Shane's. Maybe he'll play for Southampton between now and and, um, and score some goals between now and the playoff, and he'll you know be the one to pick. So um, I think our, our, the way we play will help us get more goals than we did, say, under Mick McCarthy and under Martin, I think, I said, going back to it again, but we'll be higher up the pitch and hopefully things will fall away. And We had some chances the other day. If we'd have taken him, we would have, you know, they got a couple of goals in those games. There was chances. It wasn't like we went through the games we were getting a shot, a shot off. I think it was times we could have scored. So, um, yeah, I'd be confident in creating chances and, you know, those players getting games, you know, will, will either play between now and then? Will Aaron Connolly play? Will Shane Long play? McGoldrick probably will play, but he's not, you know, prolific for mm. very good at the role he does. So, um, you know, it's a lot, lot to happen between now and then. Uh, five, six weeks um, with their clubs. Hopefully, to get game time, can get a bit of confidence. And um, you know, it's not about just them scoring goals, but chances, chances been created for Ireland and um, have been very slim over the last few years. So, um, hopefully, this ch slight change in style will will create more chances and won't be relying on a set piece in the last minute like we did the other night and like we've done over the years a lot of times. Um, hopefully, it won't come down to that. And that's out of Stephen Kenny's hands in terms of what the players do over the next month. That was put to Kenny Cunningham and Gary Breen as well this morning about what if a lot of these players don't play. Can you select them if they haven't played? And, and the two lads didn't think that would be an issue because they'll have another month of pre-season training. But in terms of, I don't know how often you turned up at Ireland camp without having had, say, the three, four games in the month beforehand and, and how 
big a difference it makes in terms of sharpness? Like, should Stephen Kenny, when the players come in, should he be picking players who've been playing first team football, or again, should he stick to what he has in his head about what his best eleven actually is, regardless of what happens at club level? Well, listen, if they don't play any games between now and then, he'll have to go with whoever has, you know, especially if they played a few games, scored some goals. Um, it's, it's, I. Thankfully, during my career, there wasn't too many times where I wasn't playing for my club and, and came into international game with, with plenty of fitness and, I suppose, uh, minutes under my belt. There's been plenty of times for Ireland, though, you know, people have come in and excelled and haven't been playing for their club. So um, you could look at both ways, but you, it's the majority of the time you want to be playing for your club and full of confidence. And you could see a scenario where none of those lads do play. Um, you know, they're all you know, borderline whether they get games for their club or not. You know, Shane just Shane Long has been a sub on and off for something for the last couple of years. Um McGoldrick is getting older and didn't mm. play as many and had some niggles last year. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for all of them to get game time. But any of them can play. I would say Stephen would have confidence in any though. So you'd imagine a couple of them would have had enough minutes and, and won't be relying on training training uh, training to keep them fit that they've got some games and hopefully a couple of goals a bit of confidence makes so much difference to your your mood and your form coming into a squad uh, you know you see lads who are playing well and they arrive and they're bubbly and they lift everyone so you know a bit of luck goes away we get a couple of those like that Stephen Kenny was clear yesterday and all week that he's not wedded to one system that if he feels that a 3-5-2 is a better formation that he won't be afraid to go there when you look at the skill set, again, watching yesterday, and even watching the way Finland played with that system and how Timo Puki would drop deep and he'd drag a centre-half with him and he'd pick up these pockets of space and, and they were able to have a nice flow. It's very similar to what Dave McGoldrick, McGoldrick does with Sheffield United. When you look at the way Ireland played with this four at the back, do you think actually maybe a 3-5-2 with Coleman in defence, with Doherty in that more attacking um, role, that, that it solves an awful lot of the problems that are there? Yeah, Even as I a short it, term for the next month? It, it probably does, but I would have liked to have done it in these two games then, you mm. know, to to have a couple of those under the belt. Uh, I, I think he's gone with this now, and that's what he, he sh probably will stick with and probably should with, should now. They've played a couple of games. This was sort of their, their chance to do that. Um, change, to, change it already, you know, does that show, you know, in the player's mind, Jesus, he really, you know, he didn't fancy that, and, you know, um, he's... he's half panic and thinking, you know, uh, I need to try something else already. That didn't work out. So um, I think that's the formation he's done consistently with the 21s and at club level, 4-3-3, three, three, and, and I, I think he should stick with it now. And I think we do have the players to do it. Um, and I've already spoke about why it probably didn't work out as well as, as it could have. But again, I go back to the coaches were new. It's Damien Duff's first time involved as a you know senior international coach. Stephen himself, you know, with all the interviews and everything he had to do, you know, that's totally, you know, a new chapter in his career. That was probably the biggest game of his life, the last two games. Um, so, you know, all that into account, I think he handled it well. And, and um, you know, I think he should stick with what he what he started now. Um, they were fine. As I said, they could have won those games. And we're everyone's looking for this, that and the other. And, you know, the people, some people are wanting to write him off straight away and everyone, others are saying give him the next four years, whatever. I think you just, somewhere in the middle ground, it's fine, don't panic. You know, give him, give him plenty of time and let him work with these players. And if we lose this, you know, it's terrible, obviously, if we lose that Slovakia game, but it's not the end of the world either. Um, he wasn't brought in to bring us, to get us through to the Euros. That wasn't his job. It was to build for the future. And I hope if things don't go his way in the next month or two, that all of a sudden everything gets thrown out at the... Pram again, and everyone wants something different, and and it will be the case. Everyone will be calling for this and the other, but I hope there's some sound heads. That's and what minds that's what's great about Irish football. It's the it's yeah, the battle you know. for the soul of Irish football. We got to be it's, over here and over there. There's there's no yeah, in between. It's it, all extremes. It is. It's always is, and it's whoever isn't picked in the squad or whoever isn't picked in the team is the talking point rather than the team. We'll always find. Seamus Coleman's never someone. been more popular. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, it's mad, isn't it? But that's just the way it is, and that's the sort of thing that you know. He has to, the manager has to deal with and see through all that. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that's, I hope he's well, he seems to be, to me anyway, to be well able to, to look through that and, and um, hopefully think, you know, I don't think long term is so important to get to that Euros for um, umpteen reasons, but, um, you know, we, he's here to build, mm. build for Ireland, to change a style of play that everyone wanted to see. You know, Mick, uh, Mick, Mick was there to do a job for, 18 months to get us to a Euros and you didn't quite get to finish that job but I wouldn't 
you know, I wouldn't blame him for the way he played or the teams he picked. He just had to get it done, and he he, he nearly did. And whether he would or not is another another matter. But Stevens here now, and we need to give him time. Not panic. You have two. I can't believe two games in and the different comments that I read and see already, and, and how well, me and you here talking about and questioning this, that, and the other. Um, with three hours Amazing to fill every sports. night, Kevin. This is yeah, not the attitude true, we true. need. You needed to be coming <laughs> yeah, on yeah. here, and you needed to be making your mind up after two matches. Yeah. You're never you going to make it up as a you you're never going to make it as a pundit sitting on the fence yeah. like this. That's the last time I'll be on after uh, <laughs> after Stephen Kenny. Um, yeah, but this, it is, isn't it? It's, it's that's just life, and you, mm. you, everyone has an instant opinion, and you want you want you want to squint those games and win three or four nil and, and be fantastic. But it doesn't work like that. And do the players he, do the players recognise that? Because a lot has been made in advance of Stephen Kenny's yeah. lack of experience with players at this level and that the first few sessions were really important that he laid down a mark and that they respected him. Do you think actually though the players would realise we're not fully at it here either so we couldn't yeah. have expected a huge amount more? Yeah, I think so. And you saw that in their interviews. I thought Shane Duffy was very honest in his interviews and he took a lot of responsibility afterwards. I don't think the players will have had one problem with Stephen Kenny um, and he's brought his good coaches around. Listen, he's I don't think it'll be an issue that way at all. Um, they all will have known of him. Um, he's been under for any one measure, but it's not like he's coming out of blue. It was plenty of media about Stephen doing really well over the last few years. Um, they will have all read that and seen what he can do. And he, he's, you know, he's he's very good at dealing with, you know, professional sports people. He knows what he's doing. I don't think there's no superstars in that squad that are, you know, going to be going around, sitting, you know, you know, undermining them or acting like that. He's he will have been. He'll be the boss. And um, I don't yeah, from what I read or what I hear over the years, his trainings are very there's no there's no reason not to buy into what he says or does. Um and he's he was the outstanding candidate for the job. Anyway, who else who else was uh you know mm. you know, who else was going to get? Who else Big was Sam. looking like Big they Sam. deserved it? So yeah, yeah, well <laughs> <laughs> there's there's um this is the future and I just hope we give it give it a, a good go, which I mightn't work out. Of course it might. It might be a disaster in a year's time and you'll be having me on here and saying it didn't work out, but I mm. think it's the right thing to, to do and to try to and I hope it does and I think I think it will, but who knows? Fair and balanced analysis from Kevin yeah. Doyle. Yeah, no good to anyone, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, great stuff. Thanks a lot for that. No worries, mate, and thanks for having me. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in depth chats with some of the biggest names in Premier League and Irish football history. The second of these sees Ian Rice. I love watching great players play, mm. I love watching great games. And Sol Campbell sit down for an in depth chat which will be brought to you on OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio on Thursday, 17th of September. Check out CadburyFC.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. The all-new OTB Sports app. It's all videos, sports news, live scores, interviews, podcasts, all waiting for you. Search OTB Sports on your app store and download now. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette made of what matters. You're welcome back at 7.58 on this Tuesday morning. You're watching OTB AM. Owen and Shane with you right away through until 10 o'clock this morning. We're live every single morning on your social channels from half past seven with the best bits from the previous night show. If you're just joining us now, you have missed some great stuff from Kevin Doyle getting stuck into Sunday's game with Nathan Murphy. You can catch the full thing back now in the Football Show podcast feed and the best place to get that is in the OTB Sports app. This morning now, we've got Mickey Quinn chatting about Emmett Og, Kilo in Longford and their 48-week ban being overturned after a successful DRA hearing. We're going to be chatting to Matt Williams about the rugby, Senny Naopu about her own life this year and Stephen Doyle will be up a little bit later on for Deal or No Deal. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Shane Hannan, how are you getting on? Not too bad, I won't keep it well on yourself. All good, all good. There's a number of different places we could start this morning. I want to go to uh, the Irish Times this morning. Uh, it's a uh, an article actually that you might see in The Guardian as well, and it's about Novak Djokovic, and the headline is immediately eye-catching. World number one Djokovic has become his sports Mayweather. 
So Brian Arman Graham has been reporting from New York over the past couple of days and we all know what's happened with Novak Djokovic and his run in with uh, the Lions person on Sunday hitting a, a ball into her neck. Uh, through ruthless domination, Djokovic has become his sports Floyd Mayweather sans the rap sheet, writes Brian Arman Graham. A champion leagues above his rivals who rules with a technical brilliance that critics degrade as mechanical and boring and like Mayweather, He's shown he's clearly willing to embrace the villain's role when it's thrust upon him and has demonstrated time and again the ability to feed off negative energy. So I saw that this morning and I thought, Shane Hannon, the perfect man to give us a deep dive into villains. You're going to give us your top three sporting villains this morning, Shane. Mm, this was a tough This was a tough thing to narrow down on because uh, when you follow different sports, you, you end up hating a lot of sports people. Um, sometimes the hatred is, is deep and you can't forgive, but uh, other times... You kind of like the person for that little bit of cheekiness, mm. little bit of maverickness that they that they possess. So, the number three for me was someone that I've met a couple of times. I've interviewed him a couple of times, um, and he's a character. And we saw that quite recently at the World Snooker Championship. But it's Ronnie O'Sullivan. So, Ronnie has had quite a storied um, snooker career. Six-time world champion now, of course, the most successful player in the history of the game. Uh, if you count ranking titles. He is just extraordinary, but he's had a number of moments over the years that you could probably say uh, put him in the, the the villains category. So famously, he walked out of a match against Stephen Hendry, uh, a UK championship. It was either a UK championship or a Masters. It was one of the Triple Crown events anyway. And uh, the look of bewilderment on Hendry's face is is worth the YouTube search alone because this just doesn't happen. He was obviously heavily fined. He went out uh, on a bender that night. Uh, he writes in his book, but it was one of just a number of issues that uh, Ronnie had. He was going through a tough time, but. He, he had outbursts at referees. He was constantly giving out to referees and, and telling them they'd placed balls wrong and uh, things to that effect. But the other one was was one four sevens. So this the maximum break, of course, uh, the the dream the dream for any snooker player, except uh, especially in somewhere like the Crucible in Sheffield, uh, the cauldron of, of the sport. And um, there were a couple of occasions where Ronnie refused the one four seven in protest. So uh, there was one occasion where he he refused to pot the black at the very end. He hit a one forty break. And the referee, Jan Verhaas, had to say to him, look, Ronnie, do it for your fans. Ronnie got down and smashed the ball into to large uh, acclaim. But he said a number of things. Peter Ebden, uh, a really slow player. Ronnie, of course, uh, the rocket and, and one of the faster players on tour. Ronnie's had different moments where he's sitting smirking in the seat beside Peter Ebden going, will you ever just hurry up? Mm. Uh, James Cahill last year, he came in for the second session with his head shaved, a little bit like Britney Spears. Uh, and of course, uh, at this year's World Championship, he, he he referred to the younger players on the tour as as numpties and uh, players that he could possibly beat with without an arm and a leg. So, that's Ronnie O'Sullivan, number the, three. The difference here is that at Flushing Meadows, Novak Djokovic would get openly booed. At the Crucible, Ronnie O'Sullivan would get openly cheered by everybody, and the opponent of Ronnie O'Sullivan would be really up against it when it comes to the popularity of the crowd. Is that just snooker people? Is that perhaps uh, an indication of the UK versus American sports fans that? there is a greater appreciation of the trash-talking Ronnie O'Sullivan than there is of, I guess, the, the moody, sullen figure of Novak Djokovic. I think snooker is, is quite a polite sport. There's a lot of deference. There's a lot of, you know, if you, if you feather a ball or, or, or foul, you hold your hands up. Uh, but it's quite gentlemanly, a little bit uh, like rugby maybe. Um, but when you have characters like Alex Higgins, Jimmy White, Ronnie O'Sullivan, who come in and kind of liven it up a bit, they're a bit of a party animal off the, off the, off the base, they make it a little bit more exciting and they don't do things the way that they're expected to do. Ronnie just rails against authority. That's why he's, he says the things he says in those interviews with the BBC because he just likes to he just likes to, to be a little bit cheeky and make things a little bit, bit more interesting for himself. So, yeah, it's probably an element of making the game a little bit more interesting, but Ronnie Ronnie has done that for, for decades now, so he's, he's still going strong and long may he continue being a, a villain in snooker. Yeah, it seems that there's going to be a thin line between a villain and an absolute hero to some people. It all depends on your own point of view on it. Who's in at number two for you? Yeah, number two, I wanted to pick someone from uh, the world of Formula One because there are a lot of villains in Formula One. You've had James Hunt, Nicky Lauda, play, uh, people who uh, people love to hate, probably because of their success. And one um, that in recent years has really stood out for me is Sebastian Vettel. So Vettel, of course, driving for Ferrari at the moment, although that drive uh, it will, be, will be gone quite soon for him. Uh, he won four world titles on the bounce by the by the age of 26. An extraordinary driver for Red Bull. You can see the, the image of him in his Red Bull livery there uh, on screen. But 
it got to the stage that he was so successful that uh, everyone was like, okay, he's won four world titles on the bounce. He's going to clearly get to the, the Michael Schumacher target of seven. Now, he hasn't won one uh, since those four. Uh, Lewis Hamilton is the man on six and uh, is, is probably on the way to seven. So he never really fulfilled that um, and didn't exactly... Uh, exceed the expectations that everyone had for him at Ferrari. Ferrari haven't have a, had a good time in Formula 1 in the last year or two, but it got to the stage where he was booed by fans during podium speeches. So he would he would win a race and immediately be booed. Um, extraordinarily successful dr- driver, but there was an incident in the uh, 2013 Malaysian Grand Prix. So uh, Mark Webber, his Red Bull teammate at the time, it should be said, was trying to defend him and, and pushing Sebastian Vettel towards the pit wall. Um, Vettel had the better speed and... Uh, over the radio, we we mentioned yesterday, a lot of people in in radio like to pat ourselves on the backs. But we had the Emro Radio Awards <laughs> shortlist announced, where where basically everyone in the radio award gets an award. But <laughs> the the Formula One radio is extraordinary, and in 2013 at this Malaysian Grand Prix, it was it was no different. I mean, uh, the uh, Red Bull um, uh, director Christian Horner, the team boss, told Sebastian Vettel over the radio, "This is silly, Seb. Come on, as in let Mark Webber go." He is the one we want to win this race. You're going to come second. And Vettel said, no, screw this. I'm, I'm going to win this race. He thought he had the speed. And in the end, Vettel won the race and uh, literally did not care about his teammate, Mark Webber. Something else happened in Mexico in 2016 during the final handful of laps. Uh, Vettel felt Max Verstappen was, was illegally blocking him and trying to back him into Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, Vettel yelled over the team radio. Again, please give an award to Formula One's uh, radio. It's extraordinary. Move, move. For F's sake, he's a... Uh, that's what he is. Vettel said, I mean, am I the only one? Are you not seeing what I'm seeing? He is just backing me into Ricardo for F's sake. Uh, and then the FAI race, direct, FIA race director, Charlie Whiting, came on uh, and told him to, to relax. And Vettel hit back. Uh, here's a message for Charlie. F off, F off, honestly. That is the equivalent of shouting at your boss uh, over the radio and telling him to <laughs> F off, which we're not going to do this morning. But yeah, that, that's why, why Sebastian Vettel deserves to be number two for me. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good shout. Uh, there's a, a common thread that I'm noticing between number three and number two, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. I've got my criteria for what makes a perfect sports villain. I just want to hear who's your number one first. Yeah, well, well I said I, I kind of like those, and I do like Ronnie O'Sullivan, and I do like Sebastian Vettel, so there's a little bit of that cheekiness that kind of rubs off me the right way, but number one, um, I'm going to find it hard to say I like him, but it's unfair on the man um, as far as he's a man, but August 3rd, 2013, <laughs> uh, Sean Kavanagh. I was standing on the hill, Owen, uh, on this day. It was wet, it was dreary. Um, I was there with one of my best friends, and uh, it was going to be a great day. We were thinking, okay, All-Ireland quarterfinal. Monaghan could potentially make their first All-Ireland senior football semi-final in I think it was since, since 1988. So the heyday of Nudie Hughes, Jerry McCarville, Bernie Murray, Ray McCarn. And I'm thinking this is going to be fantastic. We're a couple of points ahead, or a couple of points behind at this point, but Conor McManus gets the ball through on goal. And uh, we all know what happened next. Sean Kavanagh uh, pulls him down, yellow card. Uh, of course, the rule changes came into the GA after that, but it was one of those days that uh, we had to stand there again for the, for the second semi-final, which to my me- memory was uh, a Dublin win over Cork, or the, sorry, the second quarter-final, uh, surrounded by Dublin fans who just slowly dripped into Hill 16. The rain came down. Monaghan had just lost to Tyrone. And, and I can't tell you what it's like for a Monaghan fan to lose to Tyrone. It's just like my granny's from Tyrone. I, I, I live a num- only a number of minutes from the, the border with Tyrone here. It's very personal. And they're two counties who don't often get along. But that day, August 3rd, 2013, Conor McManus scored six points that day. Sean Kavanagh scored five, so they played a, a serious role in the match. But it'll be forever remembered for that for that particular moment, and for that reason, and deservedly so, Sean Kavanagh is my number one villain. Kind of rude of Joe Brady to totally steal the limelight on that situation, <laughs> and almost perfect for Sean Kavanagh. The perfect, you know, I uh, yeah, would have got away if it wasn't for you meddling kids. And uh, I mean, there were no meddling kids because Joe Brady was the person who came along and actually allowed Sean Kavanagh to get away from it with it because. The goalposts were shifted drastically in that whole discussion around him. It's interesting what you say about these three people. For me to be a really, really good villain, you need to not only win, you need to win very, very often. You need to show that the bad guy sometimes does come out on top and then do it repetitively because that will twist the knife perfectly in the public watching at home. It can't just be... I don't think Patrick Reed is a perfect sports villain, for example, because he's only won his one major, he's only won the Masters on one occasion. Granted, it's harder to win in golf, but I just don't think that he gets into the god tier 
bracket when it comes to villainy. Of course, you know, he, there's been allegations of, of thievery and other things when it comes to, to his college career, and he does have some of the characteristics, but he just hasn't been as successful as Vettel, certainly not as successful as Ronnie O'Sullivan, and doesn't have, obviously doesn't have as many All-Ireland medals as uh, Sean Kavanagh. See, that is the thing. When you are a Monaghan supporter seeing that Tyrone team beat you, if you are a Kerry supporter seeing that Tyrone team beat you repetitively in the 2000s, that is what creates the villain and that's what takes him to the very top tier. I think another thing about them is you sort of need one big moment. You need or, or maybe a multitude of, of big moments if possible, but usually these great villains ha have one big moment that you can point to and say that is the defining moment of that villain's career. So Sean Cavanagh, perfect example there. Conor McManus. Now in fairness, Patrick Reid probably does have his moment and you mentioned a couple there when it comes to Vettel and it comes to Ronnie O'Sullivan. Other people you can put in there with their one big moment for me, Thierry Henry. Now I don't oh. think he is a villain in the global sense of it. He's certainly a villain in the Irish sense of it and his one big moment is bigger than a career of villainy from Novak Djokovic, for example. What, what he did was far far uh, worse uh, to the souls of, of Irish people than what Novak Djokovic did. I just don't think Henri probably has a long enough career to, to justify true villainy, but for that one moment, he was the biggest sports villain in our world. And also, I think one of the most essential features, and I think you've touched on this well here, is that you need a redeeming feature. You need something where, at the end of the day, you might root for that villain. Now, Ronnie O'Sullivan has tons of redeeming features. I think with Sean Kavanagh, that much uh, was pretty much the same. And I actually find that the case to be with Novak Djokovic as well. Uh, the redeeming feature has been, maybe he doesn't have too many redeeming features this year, to be fair, but <laughs> I think there was always the air of the villain around Novak Djokovic. He has got booed at Flushing Meadows before. I know there was no fans there uh, over the course of the weekend, but he has been the villain of New York for quite some time and the tennis world as a whole. And the fact that he is the outsider, or had been the outsider, looking in on the Nadal and Federer duopoly for so long, that for me was a redeeming feature for so long. Like you think about yeah. Jose Mourinho, for me, ticks all the boxes as a great villain, particularly up until he goes to Real Madrid. First sent to Chelsea, perfect villain is Jose Mourinho. His redeeming feature was Arsene Wenger or Alex Ferguson aren't winning the Premier League. Look at them getting frustrated by this Portuguese plucky upstart coming into the Premier League. That for me is what makes the perfect villain. Yeah, like the, the, there's definitely an element of jealousy about the whole thing. Like, uh, look, I'm not jealous of Novak Djokovic's anti-vax stance. I'm not jealous of the fact that he decided to host a tournament in the middle of a global pandemic. But some people could say they're jealous of his winning and his consistent winning, as you said. And Ronnie, Vettel, Kavanagh, um, Mourinho, these are all uh, consistent winners. And there probably is an element of jealousy. I, 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 I'll, I'll hold my hands up. Um, I was certainly jealous of Sean Kavanagh throughout the noughties. I'm sure you were too. So... Uh, Funny a little bit. It, it's an interesting one. It definitely adds to that uh, to that villainy when when someone is so so successful. Will O'Callaghan, good morning. Morning, lads. Who's You've left out the most important villain of all here? Go for it. Luis Suarez. Oh, he ticks every single box. He has that mm. moment against Ghana, particularly where he decides to um, obviously handball it to save a goal going in, which is going to be their magic story at that World Cup. And, you know, Uruguay go on to win in penalties. So he was justified in his villainy. He has bitten opponents on more than one occasion <laughs> and he is a serial winner. And I'd imagine that Luis Suarez would happily go to a child's birthday party and steal their presents. That is the <laughs> level of villainy that you get consistently from Suarez. At the same time, he's going to leave Barcelona this summer as their third highest scorer of all time. He's won medals across his career wherever he's gone. And I would imagine ends justify the means. The other person that kind of jumped out to me, lads, when you were talking about it, was probably Mike Tyson, uh, who you consider that he retained his popularity despite some of the crazy stuff he did over the years, including the biting of Evander Holyfield. I would imagine even though Mayweather kind of plays the comedy villain quite a bit to make sure the people buy his fights, I think Tyson was genuinely a bad, bad man. And at the same time, he went out and knocked people out throughout his career and people loved him for it. So I think I'd put Suarez in there. Mm. And I think Tyson has to be up towards the top of the pyramid as well. Yeah, it's a very good shout. Uh, what's going on this morning in the world of sport, Will? Well, Slovakia own are going into next month's Euro 2020 playoff against Ireland with form equally as poor. Uh, they followed up their 3-1 defeat to the Czech Republic at the weekend with a one-all draw away to Israel in the Nations League last night. Ireland will travel to Bratislava on October the 8th for that one-off playoff. And Vinnie Pert says that that game will be very much the focus for his former boss at Dundalk, Stephen Kenny. 
Um, well, I suppose credit to, to Finland for their decent side who qualified. The shape of that sort of the five three two. Um, I just you just heard Duffy speaking about sometimes they were two v two, um, and there was a little bit of I think Stephen has used the word experimental um, around Ireland, so there was a little bit of that. Um, the, the, they just had one day to prepare for that game between the the two games, and and that's part and parcel of it. So look, um, Slovakia is the start of Stephen being judged, I would say. But there's plenty of time. I mean, um, yes, there's pressure on. This is this is big boy football now. So mm. what comes with that is is a little bit of pressure. But um, I think it's I think it's very early in Manjus reign to sort of start uh, worrying too much. Um, our players are so out of match sharpness. When you look at the, I watched England against Iceland the other day, and very similar. In- England were really really poor. And so many of our players are in the same stage from a fitness point of view and a sharpness point of view as the English players. So um, Finland last night were obviously fitter, fresher, um, and the players were, were, by and large, most of the players are back playing. So uh, I think the biggest example of it is, is Shane Duffy. He's a real leader for him. He's someone that Stephen made captain for the two games without Coleman. But he looked he looked just off it in, in sharpness. I think if you go back to the goal, he conceded against Bulgaria. Um there was a lot of talk about the midfield or whatever, but Shane's recovery just wasn't there for that goal. And um, I think that would come, that would come with playing regularly for, for Celtic. Vinnie Perth in conversation with Nathan Murphy on last night's Off the Ball. Also last night, Erling Haaland and Alexander Sorloth both scored twice as Norway hammered Northern Ireland 5-1 at Windsor Park. Ryan Christie scored a penalty to get the winner as Scotland won 2-1 away to the Czech Republic. Here at home, Sligo Rovers are up to third place in the SSE Tristy League Premier Division after their 3-1 win against Finn Harps in their Northwest Derby. Harps finished the game with nine men and also saw their manager Ollie Horgan banished to the stands in the second half. Drawdy United are the new leaders of the first division after thrashing the previous table toppers Cabin Teeley in their top of the table clash 5-1. Bray are up to second place after beating at Lone Town 3-1. John Caulfield made it back-to-back wins as Galway had a 3-0 win against UCD, while Cove were 1-0 winners in their game away to Shamrock Rovers' second team. Dustin Johnson has woken up lads $15 million richer today. He's completed a three-shot victory in the season-ending Tour Championship and in the process he topped the FedEx Cup ranking on the PGA Tour too. Johnson ended the week at East Lake on 21 under par. He was three shots clear of Justin Thomas and Xander Schauffele. Rory McIlroy finished tied for eighth place in the end on 11 under par. Leinster are likely to welcome back James Ryan for their Guinness Pro 14 final against Ulster this Saturday evening at the Aviva. The Ireland second row hasn't featured since suffering a dislocated shoulder in training in early August. Doubts persist though over Jordan Lammer who sustained a concussion against Munster and he must undergo the return to play protocols for the rest of this week. Leinster backs coach Felipe Contopomi is hoping for a more open game this week than that semi-final against Munster. I would like to think that uh... Even if, if Ulster comes and play that sort of game, um, uh, kicking box kicks and so on, um, I would like to think that we can take it to another level and, and play a more expansive game, you know, and deal better with, with that sort of game. Um, uh, it's, it's, you're there to win semi-finals and then finals, you know, and, and obviously everyone would love and we love to win them in, in a beautiful way but sometimes when the game is, is is going that way you have to grind it and, and and just make the best you can you know and hopefully at the weekend it will be a more expansive game um, because I think we we feel we, we can play a better a better game than we did at, uh, last weekend and also for spectators you know the quarterfinals at the US Open tennis get underway in New York later after his most unusual win against Novak Djokovic on Sunday night. Pablo Karina Busta will face off against Denis Shapovalov. The second seed Dominic Thiem booked his place in the quarterfinals last night in straight sets, while Serena Williams needed three to beat Maria Sakkari. Later, the 2018 women's champion Naomi Osaka will also be in action when she plays Shelby Rogers in the last eight of the competition. Fans will be allowed to the French Open later this month, despite the growing number of coronavirus cases in 
in France. 11,500 spectators per day will be split into three sessions in three different zones and everyone will have to wear a face mask. Some players have already raised concerns about safety at the tournament with defending champion Ashley Barty confirming overnight that she has dropped out of the tournament. And finally, Sam Bennett will be hoping not to be undone by the winds again with a coastal stage to resume the Tour de France. Stage 10 will start on one island and end on another with the finish into San Martin de Rey. Bennett begins the day seven points adrift of the green jersey wearer Peter Sagan. Uh, Primoz Rogalic holds a 21 second advantage in the yellow jersey Owen and Chen. Good stuff, Will. Thanks a million for that. Uh, plenty to come still this morning here on OTBAM. We've got Matt Williams joining us in about 20 minutes' time to chat through the Pro 14 final. It is Ulster against Leinster this weekend. Sticking with rugby then, Seni Naupu will be with us later on as well for an interview about her own life this year. Stephen Doyle will be on Deal or No Deal due to also a bit more chat, I'd imagine, about the Bulgaria and Finland games. We would love to hear your views. You can tweet us at Off The Ball. You can comment on the stream below if you happen to be watching on YouTube or on Facebook. Now at 20 past 8 on this Tuesday morning, we're turning back to a story we've been covering here on the show over the past few weeks. Uh, it is the story surrounding Longford Club Emmett O'Kello, who received a 48-week blanket ban over the non-payment of a fine earlier this year. The fine was originally imposed as a result of Kello not feeling not fielding a team, I should say, in an under-16 game in January. Uh, but their appeal to the DRA has been successful and the ban has been overturned. And uh, Longford GEA last night issued this statement. Longford GEA accept the written decision of the tribunal in the matter of the arbitration sought by Kilo Emmett Oak and which was delivered last night. Longford GEA are delighted to see that Kilo Emmett Oak can resume in our championships and we look forward to the completion of same in a timely manner. Our competitions control committee will be meeting tonight, which was obviously last night, to confirm fixture dates for the remainder of the senior and junior football championships. Uh, and we are joined on the line now by Mickey Quinn of Emmett Oak. Hello, Mickey, how are you getting on? Good on yourself. All good, all good. So what was the main emotion on Sunday night when you realised that the appeal had been successful with the DRA? Yeah, probably just relief. Um, just relief to get back in the football field and play games and um, what everyone wants to do. Um, you know, it was probably one of those things that we thought on Friday night that we'd have had an answer and then to kind of suffer through the weekend um, and still waiting until Sunday. We thought it was going to be Monday, but a uh, nice feeling to be able to get back and do what everyone wants to do, play ball. What were the main grounds for it being overturned for people who perhaps haven't read the, the full statement? <laughs> to be honest, I haven't even, I, once I heard that uh, the ban was lifted and I saw the conclusion side of things in the report, um, I said that was enough. I didn't go reading um, the 16 pages or trying to decipher the whole lot. But look, I think at the end of the day, it looked, um, the punishment uh, for the supposed crime that just outweighed each other, that it was just crazy to think. The, the 750 or fine and 48 week ban for a full club and um, that that was the punishment that was handed out or the the fine mm. the sentence that was handed out so look at i think at this stage now it's one of those things that we're nearly blue in the face talking about it and all we want to do is just get on with it yeah i'm sure i'm sure you've been speaking to people around the club how big a task is it actually going to the dra and actually compiling a case for something like this to be overturned because there's a few suits in a room essentially well pre-covid there would be sitting in a room i'm sure this was done over a zoom or skype but it's a fairly taxing affair i'd imagine you need to have your ducks in a row to say the very least yeah if i've just been in, in touch with uh, our chairman our vice chair and secretary and you see all the the executive committee and meetings and that have happened over the last number of weeks in order to get this over the line and, and get get the reward and the justice that, that we wanted and, and get back playing ball and um, all the time and effort um put into to to get past this has been huge um, and you know it, it's one of those things that you'd hope will the club will be stronger for it and um, once we come out the other side and the question then as well is where exactly the fault may lie or it, it, you don't want to be pointing fingers at, after this but that statement that you mentioned the 16 page kind of reason decision almost for from the dra is a fairly interesting read there, there was one line in it that said that the dra decision said longford were at fault for making the decision but that leinster council 
were also at fault for upholding it. And I think this is a, an interesting case study as to how the higher you get in these sort of situations in the GEA, the more interesting it becomes. It, I didn't even realise myself that Leinster Council had a part to play in this story. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't understand a lot of it myself. Um, like even the way how these processes work, <clears throat> I don't think uh, your average Joe in the GA community understand exactly what's going on with CCCs and hearing committees and DRAs that once it starts going up the line and there's uh, barristers and solicitors involved, um, it's it gets fairly heavy very quickly. So um, that I'm not 100%, but at the end of the day, if the way we were, are looking at it now, it's probably the, the fine and the ban was an outcome from the original mm. problem so that's something that still has to be addressed and, and sorted in some shape or form by either Lamford GA or higher up so um, that's something that needs to be sorted out behind the scenes while the football side of things carries on. How much of a lasting impact will the last few weeks, the last few months have on I guess GEA in Longford and perhaps further afield as well. Like I'd imagine you were fairly worried that you weren't going to play any football this year as a result of this ban. That can't not drive a wedge between certain parties involved in this. Yeah, there's no point in saying that uh, everything's rosy. I suppose I probably said that it left a bitter taste. Maybe it's a bit too strong of a word, but it does. Something like that, there's no point in uh, being naive to the whole thing and saying, OK, that's let's draw a line in the sand and let's move on. Everything's hunky-dory now, um, which it, it it isn't. So, like, there's there's got to be things uh, improved on and, and worked on to try and build that relationship again and, and make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, it's a voluntary organisation that everyone's in it for the same reason, um, to, you know, to, to do well and be part of something. Um, so... Look, I think that's the side of things that when you see a situation like this, uh, that comes into question. Uh, were you surprised to see the Longford statement last night saying that they were delighted to see that Emmett Oak can resume in our championships and we look forward to the completion in a timely manner? Yeah, to be honest, um, look, if they're as delighted as I am, it's great to, that we're back in. But, you know, a six-line statement after probably six, eight weeks or it's gone on 12 months, um, this whole situation... You know, it is what it is, uh, and you know we just we're quite happy to get back playing ball. Um, Mickey, you were on with us uh, last week, and you were talking about how this kind of goes against what the GA ethos is all about: community and, and volunteering. Uh, has the whole twelve-month saga left your feelings towards the GA, your love of the GA, uh, changed in any way? Is it unchanged? I mean, what are your feelings now after after such a long time of having to deal with this? Yeah, look, to be honest, I think any any sports person or anyone involved in um, an organisation or something, there's always going to be peaks and troughs with, with something like this. Um, do you know, like you'll have massive highs and lows and frustration. And I suppose that's the, that's the joy in the whole part of it, that, you know, there's ups and downs. But for something like this, it's, it can be a real downer. Um, but look, it's kind of if we can get past it in the next number of weeks and get back, to to doing what everyone wants to do and that's play football and watch football and um, that hopefully that it'll be a distant memory fairly quick uh, and can move on does do that you, sorry Shane go on sorry Owen uh, like w will it promote positive change in, in Longford GS circles do you think do you think the, the county board will have learned from from the damage this has done over the last year yeah, to be honest, it's, it's going to take time to see that. I suppose it's the right people uh, there to to oversee that change and that are willing to to probably make a stand and make that change. I think it's it's not going to be easy. Um, but I think with the right people there, that's something that can definitely be pushed forward in, in the coming years. Does that future you're talking about in terms of getting back on the pitch involve lining out in the Longford jersey? Yeah, I'm kind of looking, the way I've looked at it, um, the last, we haven't played a game and it's nearly four or five weeks now um, and we're set up now to play a game this Friday and probably a quarter final, uh, the way it's working out the following weekend and that's two games in the trot and hopefully we can push on a bit further after that but I'm not taking a look any further than two, three weeks at this stage um, see how those go and then we'll take the rest from there. Does this impact on it? Does this last few weeks and months, I guess, not tarnish your view of 
your county team or anything like that but does this impact does it come into your thinking even a little bit yeah definitely um do you know if when you when you reflect on it um that's something that you've probably given so much to that it could be just whipped off you and um, very quickly like that as a result of a, a separate matter that has probably no bearing or no connection on on your playing career or a lot of other guys and other members in the club that um that something like that could be taken away it definitely does it is something that's that you're thinking geez if that's what's going to happen or could happen it you do question things then was there support from other clubs around the county yeah definitely um do you know it's, it was one of those things that early on um do you know probably the whole ins and outs of the situation wasn't fully understood and that was probably one of the reasons why it was kind of important to to get that message across what the actual situation was going on behind the scenes because I don't think clubs in Langford and everyone in Langford knew the full ins and outs of the situation and probably still don't um so but there's definitely uh, a lot of support you know from from other clubs and letters uh, from within the county supporting um supporting Kilo Young Emmets when you say there that perhaps people don't have still don't have a full understanding of the entire story here. Is, is there more details to come out? Is there is there anything really that people should be aware of if they aren't already? Yeah, to be honest, it, probably there's there's lots of stuff there with the 16 pages and I think there's 400 page documents and other bits and pieces from all that, um, all those meetings and hearings and committees that you know, in time, whether it be a Longford County meeting or a further up the line here and somewhere down the line that uh, all those bits and pieces will be there on paper so eventually um, everything that's gone on will, will probably come to the fore. Uh, Mickey I know this was probably an unnecessary distraction for people like yourself who works as a coach in, in a school in St Mel's you know you, I think you mentioned last week there was five refer referees in the club who kind of couldn't take part in matches because of this whole saga and then there were you know, young, young fellas going for scholarships as well who uh, didn't know where they lay uh, because of all this. W was there any communication to, to people within the club that you can just continue as per as per normal now, or apologies made, or, or where where does that lie? Is there is there any communication been made if from the county side of things? Yeah, or, from the county side. And not from I haven't heard anything from from uh, executive committee or management side of things. We're kind of and most players are in a similar boat, and there hasn't been anything heard along those lines and um, so we're kind of sitting waiting and we're just kind of quite happy to to get to Friday our last group game in the championship and play it and, and see from there but you know I think there's a few guys leaving cert results yesterday and CAO offers out at the weekend you know and to get the good news on Sunday evening that the the ban has been lifted you know it's probably a weight off uh, those guys mind that they can you know actually go off to college and do something that they love doing along with simple like-minded people so have you been training for the last little while and and like are, are you fully ready to head into the weekend or has everything else kind of distracted from that I, yeah we've been kind of tipping away no more than the lockdown with the few bits and pieces that we're able to do that um you know treadmill here in the background that going for runs and bits and pieces so Look, we're kind of we're in a position now where we have a game against uh, Mostrum the, in the last group game, and that should kind of give us a little bit of match fitness and sharpness going into a quarter final, hopefully. And has the championship been pushed back as a result of this? Is things on a delay now? Uh, I presume it's pushed back a week. Um, it had been brought forward, as far as I know, is it the, the weekend of the 26th, 27th. But I presume the way it's working, um, it'll be pushed back to the 4th, um, mm. which I think it means that there's going to be, if you get that far or our side of the draw, it's going to be three, four games on the trot week in, week out. Right. And then just one last one, and sorry to labour the point here. Has, has the call come in from the county yet to, to go back in training? Because... You're just, you're just kind of realising here with all the talk we had about a month ago of teams going back early training and stuff, this is the actual week where you can do it legally. Yeah, we just got a message uh, a couple of weeks back, um, just a, a group message that, look, this was kind of where the plan was at and where things were heading in the next number of weeks. So um, that was the last uh, I heard a couple of weeks ago. So you're just going to mull that over for the next little while? Yeah. Mickey Quinn of Emmett Oak, hello. Best of luck this weekend. Thanks, Millie, for taking the call. Thanks very much, man.
Nicky Quinn there on the line, that 48-week ban overturned at the weekend after a successful appeal to the DRA. Right, Matt Williams is going to join us in just a moment to chat about the Pro 14 final. First, here is Keith Wood talking Leinster on Monday Night Rugby. Um, I always think you can see a team losing a game. What I, what I liked about Leinster on Friday, um, which was a monster fan, <laughs> it's horrible, uh, on, on, that particular, on that particular day, was that they had us under pressure all over the field. So things that were slightly out of kilter two weeks ago weren't. Um, but there was a pressure all the time. At every facet of play, there was pressure. So when um, it becomes very difficult when you're comparing like with like and players with players, because like saying Caelan Doris and Jack O'Donoghue, um, I'd say if you swap those players, um, um, Jack O'Donoghue would have a far more comfortable afternoon of it playing behind a team that was was even though they're, they're, they weren't in the lead for a big chunk of the first half, they were in control of an awful lot of that game without trying too hard. They weren't making errors. They weren't trying to do a huge amount. They were just, they were playing chess and doing it really well. Um, uh, same as Johnny. Johnny had the ball and a more attacking mindset, was running onto it a little bit more. They didn't do it very often, but when they did do it, there was a lot going on. It wasn't simple. It wasn't one out ball. Um, there was an awful lot of moving parts for it. And and he is Johnny. It's a, it's a, it's a difference between Johnny and JJ. Uh, one of the differences. But Johnny is an accomplished international who's been playing the game at a high level for a long time, and he knows the game very well. And he was he was comfortable. But so was everybody else on the Leinster team. And I felt Munster were under pressure for a huge amount of it. And I will say they were in a position to be in the game, but they weren't comfortable at any stage within that, whereas Leinster looked to be comfortable for a huge amount of it. So, um, look, I thought it was incredibly impressive. I, I do love the idea that a team like Leinster, who they do kick a fair amount of ball, but they run a lot of ball, they have a lot of ambition, they um, they have a lot of hands on the ball, a lot of tip-ons, a lot of different running angles. Um, they try and incorporate their players an awful lot more. Their wingers come in off the wing a lot. Um, they have ambition, and but they can mix it up with a kind of tough um, boot and bollock sort of game as we had on Friday and still come out the right side of a victory. That's, I mean... Like we keep talking about times in the past. If you go back 20 years, Leinster couldn't do that, but they can do it now. Yeah, Keith Wood talking with Nathan on Monday Night Rugby. Liam Toland also joined that discussion and the full piece available now on the OTB Rugby podcast feed. It is 8.37 a.m. and OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We are sticking with this team now and I'm delighted to say that Matt Williams is with us. Good morning, Matt. Morning, Alan. Nice to talk to you, mate. Yeah, you too. So, Ulster versus Leinster this weekend, we kind of led with Munster and Leinster yesterday, so we're going to flip things around today and start with Ulster. Uh, Dan McFarland saying yesterday that they've got a puncher's chance this weekend. Is that about an accurate summation of where they're at going into this game? I, I think they've got more than um, what Dan's suggesting. He's obviously playing his cards close to his chest. Um, but Ulster have a, have a pretty good record uh, against uh, Leinster, and probably because of what Keith, we just heard Keith Wood saying there, Ulster don't come down to, to, to Dublin and rope a dope. You can't rope a dope Leinster. You can't sit back and do what Munster did and think we're going to box kick a team into submission. Just Leinster, you can't beat Leinster that way. When Leinster lose, teams have got to throw a lot of punches. And Ulster almost did it last year in that Champions Cup game that that we all remember where if if uh, the ball was put down correctly uh, over the line by Jacob Stockdale, and I'm sure you'll never forget it, uh, Ulster probably would have won that game. So, and, and they came down on uh, in December last year and there was that wonderful game at the RDS, you know, 50-odd points to Leinster and 45 and a bit or something to, to Ulster. You know, they were very, very close. Ulster will not die wondering what if. They'll, they'll get all the dance out in the music. And that makes them that that Leinster don't like that. That makes mm. them uncomfortable. And so they got they got a good shot. Not 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 favourites, but they've got a good shot. 
when you're watching this game from a coaching perspective, Matt, and you're looking at Ulster over the last few weeks, how clear is their attacking identity? Do you look at them and say, all right, that makes sense? Uh, even if I didn't know this was Ulster, I could tell this is a Dan McFarland coach team. It's a really, a really good question because I've been really impressed with what Dan has done with Ulster. They've, they've played some really exciting rugby and they're giving everything to the jersey. And that's something that a few years ago we couldn't say about Ulster signs. They just, they just didn't seem to be putting in. And my um, fading contacts north of the border were saying it wasn't a happy camp and that a lot of people that were wearing the jersey you know, didn't really appreciate the history and the value of it. But that's turned around now. But since COVID, they really haven't played like they had played beforehand. Very disappointing against Connacht. Hugely courageous last week. Hugely courageous. But again, probably didn't play... It was a dramatic game, but probably didn't play like they have done before. Whereas Leinster have played some very good rugby uh, in the games since we've come back, where Ulster haven't. So... Um, and, and that's not a criticism. It's more an observation because this is really hard. What, what's occurred this season... Is, is, you know, again, that word unprecedented. No rugby teams have had to do this. So maybe this is a week where Ulster can come out and, and, and show what a Dan McFarlane side looks like. Now, last week, what we saw from a Dan McFarlane side was, one, they won't quit. Two, they'll fight to the last second of the game. And three, they just never know that they should be beaten. They were beaten in that game for all money and they refused to be beaten. Now, teams like that, that will also come out and run are really dangerous. But we haven't seen the fluid attacking play that uh, we saw at, at times last year. And, and the absolutely desperate defence that Ulster put in in some of those great uh, Heineken Cup games up at, uh, up at Raven Hill there when the, their defence was just inspirational. So, you know, I think we'll see the courage, we'll see the commitment, but I'm not sure. We've got no evidence, let's put it that way, I've got no evidence to say that they're back to their uh, the full um, throttle that they were showing uh, pre-COVID. Uh, Matt, you mentioned the the refusal to be beaten there from Ulster, and and you know two scores down facing another knockout defeat. I think they've lost six of their most recent uh, seven knockout games. Uh, were you impressed by by their mental resilience, their refusal to give up, and 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 uh, do Ulster look a little bit more mentally strong going into this final than they have in previous years going into big games with Leinster? Yeah, they, they certainly um, have shown in the last 12 months, especially in the Heineken Cup, that they've got some deep resolve back within their organisation. And that resolve has been very, very hard to find in recent times. Uh, probably since their, their um, final, when they reached the Heineken Cup final against Leinster a number of years ago, almost a decade ago, you know, they... they they haven't really shown that same fight that is what or was historically associated with Ulster teams. But they, they, have, they have shown that in recent times. And they've got a really hard uh, road. They've got Leinster away and then they've got Toulouse away. I mean, wow. It's, it's, it, unless you're playing Saracens away, it doesn't come much harder than that. I think, I think Toulouse in Toulouse still remains probably the most difficult uh, French fixture to take on, probably I'd, I'd still say that's even harder than taking on Racing in Paris. So they've got a they've got a really tough ten days on their hands. But I think this is the one where that they'll feel they've got a shot at, because Leinster are also chasing two rabbits. The old story: you chase two rabbits, you end up with none. And I'm I'm pretty certain Leinster will put out a team different to the team that they'll put out the following week against Saracens. So that while that Leinster side still beat Ulster a few weeks ago, uh, it's very different when it's a final. So I think this game will be a lot closer than a lot of people think. And, and this will also hugely depend on, on the team that Leinster put out. We know pretty much who Ulster are going to put out because they just don't have the depth of Leinster. They can't put out two 15s like Leinster can. But Leinster could have a lot of changes in, in their starting 15s from, from the two weeks. And that might just give Ulster a little bit more... Um, Hope, I think it'd be the best word to say. I guess Ian Madigan was the guy we were all speaking about after the match. Uh, took all the headlines and those five points were crucial that he kicked. 
uh, when he came off the bench. Alan Quinlan was, was on with us yesterday and talking about how he he never expected as difficult a kick as it was at the very end. He never expected Ian Madigan to miss. He just has that swagger, that aura about him. Um, how impressed were you with Ian Madigan and the battle he showed towards the end? Uh, it's a nice story. You know, Ian's a really nice guy, good guy, you know, and he's a quality player. He's just had the problems of being behind a lot of quality tens, uh, you know, behind Johnny Sexton uh, in, in uh, Leinster and Ireland. You know, remember he kicked a pretty famous kick for uh, Ireland back in the in the uh, 2015 World Cup, you know, and, and he's been on the road just trying to get starts, trying to play his game. And uh, he's gone to Ulster, got a one-year deal, and uh, just the delight on his face, you knew what it meant to him. You know, he, he's... He's going to finish his career whenever it happens, knowing that he's given it every every shot. There's there's not much more that young man could do to 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 uh, show people he's got what it takes. And uh, I was really pleased for him. You know, there's certainly amongst the Leinster guys, uh, I know they speak so highly of him and and, uh, uh, and and rate him as a person. And 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 everyone's took some joy in seeing him kick that. And look, there was a lot of pressure on him. And uh, he's, he's shown in the past he can do it, and he stood up and did it again. And if you were Embra, if we if we just flip it over, if you were Embra, you would be shattered. That's a game that's going to stick with them for a long time because they had that game won and buried and back on the bus three or four times. And somehow they'll still be looking today. They lost that game, and Ian Madigan had a lot to do with it. That conversion when he first came on, the one from the sideline, that's the thing that gave them the hope. And and that was both of them were great kicks. But that one from the sideline was an absolute belter. Do, do you start him this weekend, Matt, and just you know let him go up against his old team and kind of try and ride that crest of a wave? It's an interesting one. Um, I, I always quote uh, Donald Lanahan said something to me once many years ago that I've never forgotten. Uh, big Donald's full of wisdom, and he, he we were talking about selections, and he said something to me. He just said, "Matt, the coach knows best." So. Dan McFarlane will know what's best to do to get the best out of that team. I, I can't see him dropping his captain. I can't see Burns not mm. starting. And Burns played very well. It's not like Burns. Burns himself, um, when he took that intercept, with a great piece of communication. I don't know if, the, if, if your listeners uh, remember, uh, it looked like a certain try for, um, for Edinburgh. And Burns was running back. And the the Ulster full, I think it was, I think it was Stockdale coming up. I just can't quite recall the defender. Burns pointed to him and said, "Take him." And so Stockdale went for the ball, and that allowed Burns to either cover back inside, but he took the intercept, which stopped the, which would look like a certain try because there was there was two two uh, support players there. So I, I suspect Burn will hold his position in that in that side, and he's had a very good year pre-COVID as well. But we'll certainly see Madigan late in the game, and and obviously. Uh, Cash McFarlane's going to have a lot of confidence in Madigan coming off the bench. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Felipe Contepomi was out doing the rounds and he's in the papers this morning from yesterday. He described Friday night's game as a box kick fest. He says he actually some, had some pretty interesting things to say about kicking in general. He said, what we need to learn to take is not to get dragged into a game of contestable box kicks. There has to be more space. Is that one of the biggest things that Leinster can work on in the space of the, the eight days that they have now? Yeah, I think people will look at those tactics and, and there's two sides to the tactical equation. It stopped Leinster playing, but it also stopped Munster playing. Mm. And M- Munster didn't, you know, the stats on on the ball getting to Conway and Earls, you know, two quality wingers. Uh, I think they got one pass each in the game and I believe Conway's, the stat with Conway's pass was behind him. He had to go back and retrieve it. So they, that, that didn't give themselves uh, an opportunity uh, and, and as a, a slight segue, it also showed how important Dev Toner is to Leinster. Of course, when Dev Le- Leinster lineout struggled, they bring Dev back into that uh, lineout. He he not only called brilliantly for Leinster, but Leinster stole or disrupted a lot of uh, Munster lineouts, so they couldn't launch their attack. And and Munster, you know, I, I read what Coach Van Grand said. You know, if I was Munster, I'd be hugely frustrated. They didn't fire a shot in that game. And they, I think they got their tactics wrong. Leinster got frustrated, but I, the rain didn't help. But I would like Leinster, as Felipe said, and I know um, Felipe's philosophy on the game very well, there was lots of opportunities to counter-attack to get two and three passes into that game in, once they got the ball. 
And if Leinster can shift that ball, that's when they're at their best. You know, they bring their forward runners into the game. That's that's hugely important for Leinster. But they're counterattacking and bringing in the the um, the skills and the power and pace and footwork of uh, Lama and 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 the rest of that backline. James Lowe from counterattack uh, is uh, Gary Ringrose in particular would be. Uh, lethal off that, and that's what happens. Your outside centre tends to be the one that gets the ball off a counter-attack on the two or three passes from the fullback or the wingers. And I think Leinster will uh, will learn a lot from that. And the team's kick, they better have a good chasing line because if Leinster counter, they counter very well. Uh, Conte Pomey was also saying that the new breakdown laws are encouraging more caution, essentially, with ball in hand. Is that something you go along with? And uh, like, if that is the case, we probably have to be a little bit concerned about the product we're going to get over the next little while. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll take you back 10 years on, on to, to when the laws changed similarly and the referees constantly were penalising teams in possession for what they called sealing off it was in those times someone losing their feet coming in so your fullback would catch the ball you try and run and counter and you, the second supporting player would come in the referees were just pinging the offensive team unmercifully and it was horrid I, I was coaching Ulster at the time and I hated it so all you could do was kick you had to kick back and and you, you're saying to the refs why are you doing this why are you doing this and they just become a little bit focused on one area. And I, I would agree with, with Felipe. Like, some of the, like, we're still getting lots of offsides. The defending teams are still offside a lot. But the referees are really going off their brain about the, where the players are entering on the attacking side. And we saw that in New Zealand when the rugby uh, uh, came back there. And I think around the world everyone's kicked on with it, obviously from instructions from head office. But I would agree with Felipe that, that it, it gets to a point where you can't, run the ball and take a risk in your own half. Not because you're worried about dropping the ball, but because at the next ruck, you're very concerned the referee's going to penalise you and that's going to be three points. Mm. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, don't get me started on the needs for changing and, mm. and renewal in, in rugby and the legislate, legislators of the, games, of the game are so far behind the thinking of the coaches. Rugby has a huge, huge issue with the legislators being caught way, way behind. And this is, this is certainly an area... Um, and what, that, what the negative of that is, it, all of this penalises positivity. Mm. So you, you, you're saying that we're letting the defenders get up, they're not committing anyone to the ruck, but we're going to penalise guys at the ruck. So every bit of positive play you're trying to put about counter-attack and, and running the ball, you're, you're encountering this negativity that the laws are reinforcing. It's a big issue, and it's a difficult one and a highly complex one, but that still doesn't give our legislators at World Rugby the excuse to dodge it. And right now, I've got to say, I feel, um, there's probably some people at World Rugby who won't agree with me, but I feel they are dodging it. And they're not looking at this with the, the, um, the intellect and the urgency that it requires. Right, that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next little while. Uh, Matt, before we let you go, before we let you go, we just wanted to get your take on Munster. You mentioned them there uh, a moment ago. It, it's, like, is this, are we at a situation here now where there has to be a serious review of the Johan van Graan era? It, it, does there have to be a little bit looked into how to get the best even out of your coaching staff, let alone the players who actually take to the field? Where do you stand on those couple of questions? It's outside of one. Let, 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 let's, let's get in our helicopter and go up several thousand feet. And there are lots of teams around Europe that would give their right arm to be finishing in the semi-finals of their domestic uh, league and their Heineken Cup every year for 10 years. So finishing in the semi-finals is not a disgrace. Um, you, you know, if, if, you, we went, if we went to Ronan, Ronan over in uh, La Rochelle, we said, listen, mate, we're gonna, would you take finishing in the semis of uh, the Pro Four, uh, the top uh, 14 and the, and the Heineken Cup? I'm pretty sure it'd Roger take your arm it's off. A better league, you know? though. So, yeah, well, it is a better league, but still, you, you, you know, we can't run down our own league. Mm. That's another problem. Let's, let's, that's not that's a separate issue. Um, look, and, and Munster went with a young coach. So they went with Coach Van Graan, who's unproven as a head coach, and he's made his mistakes for sure, like we all do. Every one of us that, that steps into being a head coach, and I, I spoke to the, the late, great Axel Foley about this, you're going to make mistakes when you're the boss. That's the deal. That you, you Just accept it and learn from them and go forward. But if they're going to go with a young coach, they've got to stick with him. 
And I, I got, take you back to Michael Checker, who had a number of lean years when he first got to Leinster. If he lost that semi at Croke Park against Munster, he was out the door. Mm. They win the semi, they win the Heineken Cup. Look what Michael's done for the rest of his career. Who'd be a coach? It's a mugs game. I can tell you, it's a mugs game. Uh, I, I think Coach Van Graham got everything, a lot of things wrong uh, last week. But should he be sacked? Should he be taken out? No. Should there be some guidance given to him? I, I'd like to think there would be. He's got two very experienced and smart guys in his staff. So I, I don't know what goes on within the um, those four walls, but they all got it wrong because the tactics against Leinster... You're never going to boot Leinster like that. You're never, ever in 100 years going to boot them like that. And and, and in some ways, it gave Leinster a, an armchair ride. So that, they need some thinking, but that's not the time right now to uh, press the panic buttons. I, I think we want to see what they do in the upcoming season. And, and there's frustration. Look, I know, and I love winding up all my, all my Munster friends. I love winding them up to them about the semis, you know. There was someone put out uh, the, the uh, Hello Darkness, my old friend from the song Sounds of Silence. <laughs> And it was hello, semis, my old friends, you know, to all the Munster, to all the Munster people. Which, when you're from Leinster, you laugh. And Munster, I don't think they were laughing too much. But uh, look, look, there, there is some thinking to do, but don't hit that red button just yet. For sure. And I think the main thing here is that we're not quite sure exactly what the dynamic is. But what we can do is maybe make an educated guess. Is your hunch that Stephen Larkham is has got his proper fingerprint on that monster attack on the evidence of last Friday? Uh, on the evidence of last Friday, Stephen Larkin will be hiding under his bed with a pillow over his head. I, know, I coached against Stephen for years and watched him coach um, for, for both the Wallabies and, and for the Brumbies. He is an attacking uh, coach. He, he runs the ball. That's his heritage. Same as me. That's his heritage. He's a runner of the ball. And I saw last year plenty of Stephen Larkin over that Munster side. They ran the ball really, really well at times last year. As I said on the show last week, some, you, you can see that when they set up, Munster basically get the ball 15 metres infield. They have five or six guys on the short side. They have a pot of forwards out there and a chance to go out the back. And it's a great setup. It's a great setup. It gives all the players options. And if you had Joey Carberry there calling the shots, I'm sure things... I'm not, I'm not taking anyone from JJ Henry, but I think it's, it's designed for Joey. We didn't see any of that last week. It wasn't sighted off nobbies. So why that occurred last week, where those tactics came out, I don't know. Someone's rolled the dice. Obviously, he's got to sit at Coach Van Grand's feet. He's the boss, and it didn't work. So, um, you know, go figure. Next time they play Leinster, they've got to come up with a better plan than that because um, you, you, Leinster will eat you up with that every day. As I said before at the beginning, why Ulster got a chance? Because Ulster will throw 100 punches. You're just not sure how many are going to land. Mm. Where last week, Munster didn't throw any. I mean, I can't imagine. I, I, I can imagine, actually. I can imagine what Alan Quinlan and, and uh, all that, all that gener my generation of, of Munster players who are great guys and ultra-competitive human beings and hated anything to do with the blue jersey. They must have just been sitting there last week throwing things at the TV. It was, uh, it, it was truly remarkable to watch, to see Munster getting it so wrong, so, so wrong. Matt, you mentioned who would be a coach and, uh, you know, questioning what, what went on <clears throat> within those four walls. But uh, there's been a little bit of analysis done uh, after uh, the weekend's defeat for Munster. People talking about Stephen Larkham and how maybe he uh, has a similar playing philosophy to Johan van Graan. As someone who has spent a lot of time in, in, in dressing rooms and dugouts, uh, how difficult can that be if there's a, a couple of coaches on a, on, a, on a backroom team that maybe have slightly different styles and philosophies over how the game should be played than, than the head coach? Hugely problematic. Hugely problematic. Uh, a coaching team, just that, is a team. And, and it should integrate like the wheels of, of cogs. So what, and I'll give you an example of, of some of the people I've worked with. I've worked with Alan Gaffney. Alan Gaffney was, is a great attack coach. His, his ideas on attack. So I let Alan run the attack. I ran the defence. They were great coach, forwards coach like Willie Anderson, great scrum coaches. You, you have to bring them in and they have to share a common philosophy and you, you have to choose very carefully um, because if you don't, you get clashes and you get, you get mismatches. And, you know, uh, Munster have gone with a South African uh, philosophy and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, 
But it's a very, very different philosophy to what Stephen Larkham has been brought up with at the Brumbies. Uh, the way the Brumbies and, and ran the ball, their, their detailed planning on their attack. It's, it's totally different to the physicality and, and the, uh, the, the pure rush attack and defence that um, South Africans employ and have employed so well. Whereas Leinster have much more gone down uh, the Australian-New Zealand pathway. Uh, mm. so, so you can see that's different. Now, if you go to Leinster, uh, Leo and Felipe and, and Emmy Farrell all, have all worn the jersey and all played together. Uh, now, I know you, you've, you've got Stuart in there who, who's English, but the, the, the whole philosophy of, of that Leinster coaching group has been forged over 20 years. So they, they're very comfortable with each other. They've got to known each other, played together. They've known each other for a long, long time. So when Leo wants Felipe back, he knows the sort of person he's going to get. He's going to get this passionate, hardworking, highly intelligent man, and he knows how Felipe runs because Leo played with him for so long. Emmett has been around the team for so long. Emmett played for me. He had a horrific injury to his knee. But Emmett's been around the team also for 20 years and played and wore the jersey and understands the basic philosophies of what of, and the DNA of Leinster. You then bring in someone like Stuart who is superb at his skills and the development of the skills in the game and the decision making you've got a great group that doesn't mean Munster haven't got it but they've got to build it and grow it and that's what a good head coach is the difference between head coaching and assistant coaching head coach he's got to have a vision but he's got to mold and bring everyone with him and sometimes that's hard uh, depending on the group sometimes your group is given to you and you've got to make that's when it's it's even harder so if coach Van Graham has chosen Stephen Mark and that hasn't been chosen for him and Roundtree, then he should have known that those philosophies could be melded and joined together. That's what he would have... If, if he's just been thrust on him, which I don't know, I would hope it wouldn't have been, uh, then, then that's a different kettle of fish. But that's what makes head coaching so different. It's not just the tactics. It's not just the, the, the day-to-day. It's getting the culture of the players, the whole organisation, and getting the best out of your staff. You know, getting your staff to give you everything they've got. That's when you see... Great teams like like the, the the New Zealand national team, when uh, in the World Cup final when it was in New Zealand Eden Park, they scored a, a trick line out play against France, and the whole coaching staff uh, reached down to the forwards coach and smacked him on the back, you know, rubbed his hair, smacked him on the back. That's your try because you came up with it. You get joy out of each other's successes. You're not trying to keep it for your own. You, you, you get joy out of seeing the people you work with do well and things go great. So. And right now, I just don't see... I'm not seeing that at Munster. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean there's there's fighting or anything, but you're not seeing that cohesiveness that we, we're seeing at uh, at Leinster, for sure. But they're still making semis. That's yeah. This is this is not failure. And this is... They're not winning and they're not getting trophies, but they're still making semis. You know, if, if they're not making semis and they're not making playoffs, yeah, OK, right out. That's a big problem, especially for a big club like Munster. But I'm going to say one other thing in this. Uh, to finish off, I've been talking too much. It's not like me, is not it? Not at all. Uh, mate, you know, I'm gonna say, the Munster guys are trying their guts out. But if you pick a combined munster Leinster side, there's not many Munster guys make it. Right now, Leinster have just got a really high-quality group of players. And as players, they're, they're probably better than the Munster players. Now, I'm not saying anything against the Munster players. I'm not talking them down. That's just the reality. When, I, when you coach a great side, you walk out, we're going to beat this side by 40 points because your players are better. And other days, you know, you know, you stand there and you look at, wow, it's going to be a tough day because look, at, look who they've got in their team. They're going to kill us. And that usually happens. There's an old saying, coaches don't make players, players make coaches. And Munster just haven't got the high quality there at the moment compared to Saracens before they were uh, relegated and, and Leinster and probably Rassie as well. Uh, you know, maybe maybe to lose in, in that mixture in Exeter. They just haven't got the quality of players. So sometimes a coach can't do anything about that. Uh, so it's a complex issue. It's not uh, it's not just a black and white one. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Uh, Matt Williams, appreciate your time. Thanks a million for taking the call. Pleasure, guys. Lovely to talk to you. All right, it is 9.03 a.m. We are sticking with rugby and speaking to Seni Naopu next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Okay, so 
Ireland Active Fitness Day is happening on September 24th, and it's going to see people across the country getting involved in a host of free activities in leisure centres, in gyms. You're going to have schools, workplaces, and exercise professionals also getting in on the action as well. Seni Naupu is an Ireland Active Ambassador, and I'm delighted to say she is with us now. Seni, how are you getting on? Hi, Owen. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, thanks for having me on. And look, it's fantastic to be here to, to launch National uh, Fitness Day for Ireland Active. It's going to be such an awesome day in general. So many free events around the communities across all of Ireland for anyone to get involved across any age group, any ability. Just get amongst, get out of the house um, and get involved. I'd also say that maybe a few of us over the last few months have become experts in being active. So hopefully uh, you stay active after the actual day itself on the 24th of September. Well, that's the thing. It seems like <laughs> a real opportune time to be talking about something like the National Fitness Day because we haven't had a lot of positives to talk about this year. But as a country, the statistics are showing that one of the few positives we do have to talk about is that Ireland is a more active place than it was before the pandemic. People have been getting out, they've been exercising, they've been trying new things. As you say, there's more experts in fitness this year than perhaps at any other recent time in, in Irish society. So it is something we can be proud of and it is something that we can capitalise on now. Absolutely. The positive things I've been seeing, and you've probably seen it yourself, is the increase in numbers from a social distance, which is super important, um, of people being active, out and about, using the infrastructure that was there and is there for a reason in terms of, you know, your, your bike lanes and wider footpaths and those sorts of things to encourage people to be active who might not necessarily enjoy team sports. Mm -hmm. But also there's fantastic uh, facilities in place if you do enjoy you know, your community team sports and those sorts of things. There's a number of uh, dance clubs even if you want to, uh, you know, get your uh, TikTok dances a bit uh, <laughs> higher level. Um, I know a few mums and dads out there also into the <laughs> TikTok theme as well. So plenty to be active um, with. Yeah, that's it. Maybe TikTok is actually the reason why everybody's just uh, exercising a little bit more this year. And it's 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 really good point you make that, I mean, it's you're not stuck to a team environment as great as a team environment can be people who live busy lives can exercise on their own now and i guess there's a greater interest in it this year uh, so we should get straight into the year that you've had it's been a rather extraordinary few months uh, from your point of view if you go back to the england game the injury you sustained in that game and what happened thereafter so for people who don't know the story for, for what's happened over the last few months. How have you spent uh, the few months after that England game at the Six Nations? Um, thanks for checking in and asking. I appreciate it. Honestly, I'm, I'm grand. Um, the last few months, five, six months, have been an ordeal for everyone, really. Um, I've been fortunate to um, have found something that's non-injury related actually so it wasn't quite an injury mm -hmm. uh, touch wood I'm touching wood right now um, yeah so it was something that was picked up during a match and um, very fortunate to have the experts and just strong support team around me in terms of you know Irish rugby medics and physios and uh, the very best in the vascular department of vascular surgery in St Vincent's to excise something from the neck so everything is uh went to plan everything went to plan so honestly i'm grand i'm fine i'm very conscious very aware that there's many others out there perhaps waiting for surgery or in well worse off position than me that um you know there's there's, there's certainly much more worse things than uh, you know what what I went through, which um, something in itself. But at the same time, you know, everyone has their own wee challenges that they've been going through over the last number of months. Whether there has been from a physical point of view or mental point of view, very aware that different, you know, societies and departments in terms of different job sectors and those things, people are suffering big time. Um, mm. And I'm really one of the things that I'm really passionate about and being part of this launch today and being an ambassador for Ireland Active is, is that one constant thing all of us can control is how we can incorporate physical activity into our lives uh, on a regular basis, making a part of your lifestyle from a mental health 
mm. mental well-being point of view. Um, and through all the challenges, maybe one of the constants was that we were able to stay active um, throughout this period, period, whether it's whether you live by yourself or with someone else or whatever your household looks like as a family, you know, staying active was probably one of the key constants right. throughout the last number of months. Um, and so, you know, when you speak about National Fitness Day on the 24th of September, we should all be experts by then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, I should have rephrased that last question. It, it, it wasn't a, an injury you sustained against England at all. As you said there, it was what you thought was an injury at the time until you find out it's something very different. Is that correct? Yeah, so it was a precautionary scan. So um, you always trust and respect the experts that, that uh, you know, uh, ensure that you get the precautionary scan, mm. which is exactly what it's there for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something. So if you play to the experts in Sanctuary um, here in, in Dublin and the likes of Dr. John Ryan and, and our own RFU medic, um, Matt Cosgrove and Andy McDowell, all, all of our team who uh, are excellent at what they do. Uh, and this is just another example of, thank God, we sort of got through it. And again, as I mentioned, very aware and conscious of those. And I'm thinking of those who are yet to get surgery or yet to be seen or who are going through their own sort of health problems um, at the moment. So, you know, I hope that they also get the support and help that they need too. Right. Uh, is it the case that most rugby players, whenever they have an injury that requires a scan, it is a precautionary scan? And uh, I guess in very, very, very rare circumstances, does that precautionary scan ever actually result in the thing that you are being precautionary about? Uh, and in your case, they found a little tumour in the neck area. Uh, and no worries if you don't want to, to go into the details of all of this, but it just seems like an extraordinary story that after what you must have thought was a fairly routine check that that ends up coming up as a result of an injury or as a result of a, a knock that you sustained in a rugby game. There must have been such a strange feeling around that, knowing that because you were in that position, you managed to, to get it checked and to, to, to get it sorted immediately. Uh, and without that moment in the rugby match, you might not have found out about it for a little while longer. Yeah, um... It certainly was, uh, it's what they term as, uh, what, when I say they, I mean medical experts term as an incidental finding. Um, I'm not the first as well, you know, there's other uh, players who, for their own reasons, choose not to highlight certain things, and they might have found, you know, might have experienced some incidental findings as well. So certainly it's, uh, you know, there's absolutely 100% no need to feel sorry for me, I'm grand. Um, but in terms of the awareness of the key um, messages for me around that situation which is a reminder around things happening for a reason uh, and in your own way however you want to interpret things um, the timing of it as well and the team we played against all of those things were you know aligned itself to be a blessing in disguise really the first time I thanked England for uh, <laughs> after playing them and um, yeah it was also just a bit of a um, just a humbling environment to be part of in terms of not just for me as an individual player, but just us as, um, I suppose, as one of the Six Nations to be part of a competition like that uh, because it was one of a very rare opportunity where you see the community come together and, you know, wish each other well off the pitch. And, you know, I had uh, highlighted it in a social media post over like, put out there a while ago in terms of you know what the competition means in terms of not only the performance aspect and what it delivers from a spectator point of view and a player point of view union point of view but also from a friendship over rivalry point of view and that really is what the rugby community globally um, is all about and that's how it's sustained so just felt really humbled to to be in their company and again look it's not about <laughs> Me or the injury is just about the power of yeah. the community, the power of the rugby community. And then again, the power of the community, if we can come together and be active <laughs> for one day together and then keep it going. And that's what it's all about, the community. Yeah, and I think I speak for everyone in saying that it's fantastic to hear that you're doing so well and that the recovery has been 
so quick, I guess. I mean, that, that, that you're in to a, a Six Nations squad once again for the remainder of this year and that, I guess, things seem to be going onwards and upwards for you personally. Like, it, I, it's hard to know whether or not a pandemic at that moment was the worst thing in the world or, or whether or not that pause button was the thing that you required at that time to actually just stay at home and to, to kind of consider what's just after happening. I, I'd just love to hear how, how those few weeks at the start when you're locked up at home and we're all locked up at home and after you've gone through such a, a big shock, I'd suspect, after that England game. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking. Honestly, I appreciate you even, yeah, considering those chicken questions. I honestly I keep having on about um, there are other people well worse off than me. <laughs> you know, it certainly it was a, yeah, it was a challenging time, you know, and I do acknowledge that. And um, it was probably more challenging that I wasn't able to get home to New Zealand. Sure. Um, it's the third time. So we had our flights ready to go and it kept being pushed back. So to be honest, that was probably the biggest challenge. Um, but, you know, you learn to adapt and you get through different periods. And um, as a squad member as well at the time, we kept training and working away and those sorts of things. So I had other, you know, uh, thankful to have other projects and bits going on to almost distract myself um, from, uh, you know, thinking about it too much, to be honest. Yeah, uh, it, it's, I guess, probably the, the second time in your career where you've had a prolonged time off. I mean, I guess with rugby, there's this interesting thing where we talk about sabbaticals with a lot of great rugby players over the last few years where taking time off is necessary. I guess this is your, your second prolonged break from the game. I, I guess speaking from experience, how mentally refreshed did you come back to the game after your first break? And I guess... Oh, oh, and I'm so sorry. It actually paused oh, for, no. like, for like maybe 10 seconds. <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll just rephrase there. It's just uh, having had your, your second break uh, yep. from rugby, essentially enforced this time, yeah. obviously. Like, is there a certain freshness that you come back to the game with? Does, does that freshness feel like it's in your head at the moment and that you're looking forward to getting back on the pitch right now? Absolutely. And I think that freshness entails a fresh perspective, uh, mm. not just for myself, but I imagine others as well, depending on your outlook in life and your mindset and your motivations and what it is that you're wanting to achieve and things. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, really fortunate that uh, for something like a surgery, anyone else will know who's, who's experienced it. I was really fortunate to have been communicated the different scenarios. So for me, the key was how I mentally prepared before it and what was to be expected and how to reset my expectations from a personal point of view. Um, and then obviously priorities as to, for my role as a person, let alone as a player. And yourself will know that yourself in terms of performing around with the family and things like that. Um, so yeah, from a first perspective, absolutely. From a motivation point of view, I've never been more motivated. So our, obviously our focus from a rugby point of view is, is on uh, December and how best we can prepare from a process focus point of view into our next camp. And before that, day by day, week by week, camps, those two games, whatever squad is selected for that, and then into the, the three games in December. Please God, they happen. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah. When you say there's any that you spoke about different scenarios that were presented to you, could I ask you what were those different scenarios and how wide ranging were they? Uh, yeah, quite wide ranging. Look, like anyone who goes through something like that, it's it's going to be extreme one way or the other. But uh, look, we're really fortunate to have some of the best surgeons in the world in Ireland. Uh, really thankful, Dr. Joe Dado and the team of uh, registers there in the Department of Vascular Surgery just did their thing, what they were excellent at. Um, yeah, it was just, yeah, it was, it was one of those things that, um, like anything, there's always going to be consequences either way. Um, so this is the best case scenario. Um, I was actually, it was interesting in terms of the recovery after and something that I suppose uh, I'd like to highlight in that um, 
I had to learn and I'm still learning, you know, how to breathe again, how to walk and run and jog and get back into things. So, you know, that's actually something for something like National Active Day. Yeah. And if you're not involved in a team sport, you know, I had to walk. I had to, the success for me three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, sorry, was walking as fast as I could for two minutes. That was success for me, you know, for one of the days. And I built up each day to the point where the week after I was able to jog and I was able to build the jog into a faster sprint, into 80%, 90 and to the point where I was able to complete sessions last week in our national camp. But that's all a process focused towards something. And anyone who you know, might not really be motivated at the moment to be active, that's that's fine. Maybe you could find something to to aim for. It might be something as, you know, wanting to cover a certain distance of a walking track or something. Um, but absolutely find something. Step up, get out of your house or whatever it is and get involved in something, get a goal and work towards it. And it literally is one foot in front of the other. Sydney, I must say that is absolutely remarkable. So three weeks ago, I didn't realise it was that recent. It was very much about get, getting up and running. And then last week, you're doing full training sessions. That That is, uh, I'd imagine for you personally, uh, I, I guess a huge milestone to be able to take part in these full sessions. To, to go from that place to playing test rugby uh, uh, before the end of the year, like that is that is a remarkable story. I've still plenty to go though. I've still plenty sure. to go. Absolutely, yeah. So everything is abiding by our medical experts and physios and our coaches. So you know, this is all in complete respect and within the framework of what my post recovery was going to look like. Um, so thankfully, I'm on track for a safe return, and it's uh, we're cognizant to not rush it as well. So we're sensible around it. It's uh, but it's more for you know just from a personal contributing point of view to the squad and being able to be in the environment or be at a different voice. Um, that's probably been my most challenge. I'm, I'm an over-communicator when it comes to being on the pitch and off the pitch too. But, um, you know, that's been a challenge in how I communicate differently, but as effective as it was. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. Uh, Sandy, we, we are out of time. There's... We, we, we should chat again before we <laughs> chat, chat some rugby and, and, and chat about uh, the, the upcoming games. As you say, fingers crossed, go ahead this year. But I think anybody listening will uh, understand what an incredible story it's been for you this year. Very best of luck with the rest of the recovery. And it's great to see you're doing so well. Oh, and thanks so much for your time to chat. And I appreciate that. And I hope you keep well. Cheers, Sonny. Not sure if you realise this, but that football club you support, no one likes them. No one likes Liverpool's obsession with history. Thank God Liverpool won the Premier League last season for that very reason. Because that period when you were claiming that the Club World Cup was something more than merely the club version of the Confederations Cup, yeah, that was a pretty excruciating time. No one cares about that. No one even cares about the 2019 Champions League final. It took place like two months after the season finished. It was more like a pre-season friendly for the following year. Also, lads, it's Tottenham. Really, does anyone care about Istanbul, I mean, AC Milan had an average age of 51 in their bat line that night. Milan Baras was offside in the lead up to Smeetzer's goal. And Jimmy Traore played the full 120 minutes. Really, no one cares. Also, Istanbul, guilty of awful traffic and noise pollution. Terrible city, no one cares. No one likes Liverpool because before they won the Premier League this year, they were so beyond obsessed with history that they actually created that CGI version of Bob Paisley. And it wasn't just one video that they did. In a weird spin-off to The Sixth Sense, Ian Rush sees the ghost of Bob Paisley and proceeds to full-on shoot the breeze with him. Nice to see you, boss. Still keeping me on my toes. I always knew how to get the best out of you, Rushy. By the time I got mad, I'm asked you to put me on the transfer list. It is still the best cutscene that has come from FIFA 17's The Journey Mode. If that didn't give you nightmares for weeks, then step on up to Shankly Hotel where you can't go for a pint without the ghost of Bill Shankly stalking you around the place. Look at that, like a live reminder that in life, no matter where you go, there will always be a really annoying Liverpool fan telling you about how interesting they are because they are a Liverpool fan. No one likes Liverpool fans, especially the famous ones. Dr. Dre is a Liverpool fan. 
Al Sadi Gaddafi is a Liverpool fan. So if you like overpriced headphones or allegations of war crimes, then you are probably a Liverpool fan. No one likes Jurgen Klopp. He is football's version of the Steve Buscemi how do you do fellow kids meme. No one likes the Liverpool crest. The liver bird is simply a pathetic choice of animal for your crest. If you're going to pick a bird for your crest at least pick something more terrifying. Like why not go for a harpy eagle or a red tailed hawk or blue eyes white dragon. Not a bird that feeds only on fish. The liver bird looks like a pet Dumbledore would keep. No one likes James Milner. Now I get why Liverpool fans like him, he is the consummate professional, he's a good presence around the dressing room and keeps himself in very good shape. But James Milner, you are supposed to be 34 years of age. As a 34 year old, the dad bod is supposed to be well on its way. This is not a dad bod. This is the body of a 20 something year old Love Island contestant who has entered the show after three weeks and is absolutely going to shake the villa to its very core. Could he not just like stop being really successful, maybe retire? develop an addiction to shish kebabs, maybe get in the habit of putting away a four pack of tenants per episode of Line of Duty or something like that. I don't know, just a suggestion. Be more cool, more likeable. And just a reminder for everyone down the back, no one likes Liverpool fans. In general, no one likes how insufferable Liverpool fans are. No one likes how Liverpool fans have totally embraced that insufferable tag and have called themselves the unbearables. No one likes how Liverpool fans have totally embraced the fact that everybody is annoyed by them calling themselves the unbearables, thereby painting a picture of themselves as a genuinely self-deprecating and modest fan group. F***ers. OTB AM this is OTB Sports Radio. This week on Dadcast. Yeah, I think we'd all like to have that idealistic morning of we sit together, we have warm porridge, we all talk about what might happen and our hopes and dreams for the day, but that's not real life. Dadcast with Cadbury Fredo Treasures. Tuesdays from 3 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in on the OTB Sports app. Brady and Belichick have been at the forefront of the credit in New England for the last 20 years. OTB's American Football Show, The Snap on OTB Sports Radio. So very much thrown in the deep end. He seems to have the correct temperament. I've never been totally won over by his actual talent, to be honest. Keep updated with American football on OTB. Tune in to The Snap every Friday on OTB Sports Radio. OTB. AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. You're welcome back. It is 9.26 a.m. Just to tell you that OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in football. The second episode sees Ian Wright and Sol Campbell sit down for an in-depth chat, which will be brought to you on OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio on Thursday, the 17th of September. Check out CadburyFC.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Time for the sports pages. OTB AM. OTBSports.com this morning is where we will start. Leading with the news that Conor McKenna has announced his shock AFL retirement. Shane will have the details on that in just a moment. Meanwhile, Dustin Johnson seals FedEx Cup following Tour Championship victory. Ashley Barty won't be defending her French Open title. This is big boy football now. That's a quote from Vinnie Perth on giving Kenny time to bet in. And Contopomi is not surprised by Ulster comeback at Murrayfield. The Irish Times this morning. Leads with Emmett Malone's piece on Ireland. Kenny will be keen to see players get game time ahead of Slovakia. And Foden and Greenwood sent home after Covid breach. The Irish Independent leads with the news that Niall Quinn has opted to quit his FAI role in order to end hostility. Deputy's job won't be refilled as Owens warns of no crowds at games in 2021. And more here from Felipe Contepomi. That the Farrell ban will not diminish Saracen's threat. The Irish Examiner goes with... Michal Briody of the CPA. COVID could see split season in 2021, reckons CPA chair. Meanwhile, FA begins probe as Foden and Greenwood axed for COVID breach. McGeekin sees Lions roles for Lancaster and Schmidt. And John Fallon writing a comment piece on Niall Quinn. In a year of turmoil, Quinn's decision to leave role at FAI is no surprise. Next up, we have got the Irish Daily Mail. Stupid boys is their headline. Greenwood and Foden sent home in disgrace. 
pair break COVID rules by sneaking girls into England Hotel. United and City are left fuming. Meanwhile, Leinster star Ryan in reckoning for Pro 14 final. Not that Leinster needed to be strengthened any further, but it looks like James Ryan could be available this weekend. The Irish Mirror leads with Harry Plotter, which is a position beside a photograph of Harry Arter there. It's been a slow start under new management, but midfield ace Arter charting route to Euros and opportunity of a lifetime. Meanwhile, Lions Cubs kicked out in disgrace over COVID breaches and Carlo gets his £22 million hot rod. James Rodriguez aims to end Everton's 25-year tro trophy drought. They've got him for a fee of £22 million. The Irish Daily Star leads with Greenwood and Foden. Their headline is Dumb and Dumber. Foden and Greenwood sneaked girls into hotel, sent home in shame. Clubs planning harsh disciplinary measures. Meanwhile, Doyler firmly backing Kenny. Kevin Doyle backing Stephen Kenny to be a success as Ireland boss. And uh, also there in the back, you got a photograph of Dustin Johnson uh, with the, the FedEx Cup last night. Uh, the Irish Sun, Sleazy Jet is their headline. Greenwood and Foden fly home after hosting girls. Southgate wraps naive stars for COVID-19 breach. And then a little speech bubble coming from the plane. I was looking forward to meeting Miss Denmark as well. Uh, Kenny will need time, says Neil O'Reardon. And the Quinn bin is the headline in their story about Niall Quinn stepping away from his current role. That is the lead on the back of the Herald this morning. Quinn steps aside, move to remove the hostility towards senior pair. Farrell to learn fate ahead of Blues tie and window to the dubs. Brogan book a rare insight into champions. We'll come to that in just a moment. The Racing Post on the front page goes with veteran Dwyer Hale's fantastic pile driver. And on the back page it is a preview of Denmark against England. Danish Blues, difficult night in store for England. It's a 7.45pm kickoff. The Daily Telegraph goes with England pair sent home in disgrace. The Guardian goes with the same thing as you can imagine. I've got to support them, he says. It's uh, Southgate. He's back in Greenwood and Foden after virus breach. And then finally, young, gifted and disgraced. Greenwood and Foden axed from England squad. Duo broke COVID rules to meet women at team hotels. So that is the London Times this morning. They are your newspaper headlines this morning. Shane Hannan, you're still with us. What are we starting with when it comes to the stories? Yeah, I guess we'll start with that news uh, about Conor McKenna. And uh, I probably shouldn't have been so harsh on, on Tyrone at the start. Uh, from the outset, I, I know I stuck the, the boot into Sean Kavanagh. But uh, Conor McKenna's mother and my mother are actually cousins. So right. I, I should uh, preface it by saying that. But um, uh, we actually haven't met. So I'm, I'm sure Conor's not even aware of that fact. But uh, yeah, this is quite an interesting story that uh, clearly one of the AFL's hottest Irish talents in, in, in many years. I mean, he... he was not Ireland finalist, as we remember, with Tyrone's minors back in 2012 and linked with a move to Oz as early as 2013, so still just a kid. Uh, then in late 2014, it was announced that he would be signing for Essendon uh, as a defender. So uh, he's had quite an interesting time with Essendon since represent, re representing them since 2015. Um, uh, the, the homesickness issue, Owen, is obviously one that's come up quite a bit for Conor McKenna. Um, he came home from his brother's wedding last year, 2019, saying, I was very happy to be home for a week. Uh, and at different points expressed his desire to be back home in Eglish. Uh, he, he often attended Tyrone matches as a spectator when he could. Uh, and then in a statement released by the club around that time where all this homesickness stuff was happening, uh, Essendon's Dan Richardson uh, saying that he had the club's full support to return to Ireland and that it was important for him to spend some time with his family uh, and get some time in Tyrone when he could. Then, of course, there was the media storm after testing positive for the coronavirus. So Conor McKenna really became the fall guy, and I know we spoke about it in this show as well, uh, and remarkably heavily covered in uh, Australian media. So he, he recorded this initial low-level positive test for COVID-19. He then subsequently recorded a series of negative tests, um, and then uh, the fury around him kind of subsided from this. So the, the ramifications of that positive test were widespread, but uh, the AFL banned full contact training for its players uh, amid a number of new rules. And you have people like uh, Ray Hadley, who's a, quite a controversial figure in Australian media, saying he should be suspended indefinitely for an act of stupidity that could cost the AFL hundreds of millions of dollars, let alone the players. The AFL will be a basket case because of the stupidity of one person. So he felt the wrath uh, of a lot of people in the Australian media. Uh, and who knows if that's heightened his sense of of, of wanting to return home. Um, 
But this statement came as quite a quite of a surprise, uh, to be honest, because uh, it, it, it's come in the last uh, number of hours overnight, probably for here. But uh, Connor's own comments, he says it's been a difficult year for everyone, but it's also been a chance to take stock and weigh up several things in my life. So the time is right. I'll always be grateful for Essendon and support of both myself and my family since I arrived. It, it, you'd have to say a lot of people have probably taken stock. If anything positive is going to come uh, from the coronavirus pandemic, it's that people have taken stock, maybe uh, had a better work-life balance for a lot of people. And, and I kind of decided what, what's important in their life. And clearly Connor has decided that what's important for him is is home and family and, and back in Tyrone. So the big question, I guess, is mm. will he be back in a, in a Tyrone jersey under Mickey Hart? So that remains to be seen, I guess. But you, you'd imagine so. Yeah, at some point, you'd imagine so. Whether or not it's going to be this year remains to be seen. Uh, we've got to talk about Mason Greenwood and um, and Phil Foden. I uh, I have uh, written on Jaden Sancho on my screen here now. Phil Foden and Mason Greenwood here. Uh, what has happened for people who might have been living under a rock yesterday, Shane? <laughs> Yeah, a bit of a mad one, this. So the uh, the FA investigating breaches uh, of COVID-19 protocols after England's 1-0 Nations League win against Iceland on Saturday. So uh, Foden, 20 years of age, and Greenwood, 18 years of age, both made their senior international debuts for England in that game. So clearly they were buzzing, happy to, to have made their senior international bows, a massive moment in their career. Uh, but then is when uh, shit hit the fan, essentially. So... Uh, reports in Icelandic and other media started to emerge that Foden and Greenwood allegedly met two women in a separate part of the hotel away from where the England team were staying themselves. Uh, videos gone up on Snapchat of, of the, recorded by allegedly by the girls of the two guys just sitting in the, in the hotel room. Um, Gareth Southgate then asked about the reports. He said, nothing has happened in the areas we occupy uh, in the team hotel. We're still getting into the depths of the information. But uh, a Reykjavik Metropolitan Police per- spokesperson said both players were fined uh, the equivalent of about £1,300 sterling. Uh, so quite a serious breach. And, and uh, an FA spokesperson then had to come out and, and basically say that they spent time outside of our private team area, a breach of our COVID-19 rules. Uh, they did not leave the hotel, but they accepted it's an unacceptable breach of protocol and have both apologised. So I think Gareth Southgate's reaction to this, Owen, is quite interesting. Mm. Really, really strong on this. He said it's a very serious situation. We've treated it that way, acted very quickly. I recognise their age, but the whole world is dealing with this pandemic. And then he was asked if, if this has damaged their chances of, of maybe England selection in the future. He said, it's too early until I have all in- information and I'm totally aware of every situation. I don't think I should be making those comments. I'm a father of young children and I know young adults can get things wrong. Yeah. Um, the players have obviously apologised. Manchester City and Manchester United have commented as well. A bit of a headache for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. This is only weeks after Harry Maguire's incident in Greece as well. So not what he wanted this close to the start of the new Premier League season. Yeah, no, definitely. I think as well, it's that's it exactly. It's just a, a small inconvenience from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's point of view. I think we probably need to keep a little bit of perspective here when it comes to this incident, I guess. The, yeah, a lot of... I, like, we've seen a couple sorry, of the, oh. the, the headlines here that might be the same in the UK this morning. Like, mm. sleazy jet, dumb and dumber. Like, I, you, you, would, you would have to fear sometimes about... Stupid boys, the the back of the the Irish Daily Mail. I'm not sure if that's going to be the same headline as they have in the in the Daily Mail in the UK uh, this this morning. But you sometimes fear for young English footballers and the way some of them get torn apart by being in the public eye and by doing something that isn't the end of the world. Of course, they were wrong to do what they do. I'm not for one second suggesting that it wasn't. But certainly, I thought to myself, God, this is. Some of these situations turn out quite ugly for uh, English footballers. Uh, the protection of Gareth Southgate and uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer might need to be afforded to uh, like the likes of Mason Greenwood here. Um, you might think over the next little while, a little bit of perspective I would have thought needs to be kept. Yeah, and uh, just as you read the, the headline there, Stupid Boys, that sounds eerily familiar to the, to the David Beckham, Diego Simeone mm. uh, headlines when, when he came back from that World Cup in, in 98 and, and faced an incredible backlash in every away match he had for Manchester United was was probably torture for Beckham, the abuse he experienced. But they're young players. People have to remember they're 18 years of age and 20 years of age. If they were your sons, you'd be horrified to see the headlines that are that are going around. And you, you've seen ex-pros come out as well. Chris Waddle has said it's a horrible lesson to earn at a young age. Look, They're young, they're naive. Peter Shilton as well tweeting that uh, are the cracks starting to appear with the discipline in the England camp on the pitch and off it? Uh, Walker getting sent off in ridiculous fashion for a second city challenge and then Foden Greenwood with this. So... Uh, there's been a lot of backlash, but uh, you'd have to feel for them. They're only they're only kids at the end of the day. The last story you want to touch on this morning is Bernard Brogan. His book is out, basically, or is set to come out, written with Kieran Shannon. It looks brilliant, I must say. Mm. I haven't read it myself. Looking forward to get my, getting my hands on a copy because some of the 
tidbits included across the papers this morning are fascinating. Colm Keyes yeah. and John Fogarty are, are two of the pieces uh, I've read this morning. Uh, just very briefly, just to, to, to go through some of them, his relationship with Jim Gavin is going to be one of the themes that is most interesting from this book. We all know that Bernard Brogan wasn't the first choice forward near the end. I didn't quite realise how low down the pecking order he was. He says that in one situation, 2019 season, prior to the 2019 championship, he has a meeting with Jim Gavin when Gavin reveals to Brogan that there is a hierarchical status within the squad. So, Tier 1 has 12 players, 12 automatic starters, in Jim Gavin's opinion. Tier 2 then runs from players 12 to 21, self-explanatory whether or not they're going to be in the team or not, and then Tier 3 takes it to 36. But then there is a fourth tier, and the fourth tier incorporates just five or six players outside of that. So ta that takes you to like player number 40, player number 41. Bernard Brogan is told by Jim Gavin the night, one of the nights before the 2019 championship that he is in tier four. At no point did I ever realise that Bernard Brogan was around pick number 40 for this Dublin team. It's kind of fascinating. There's a lot more in here. There's a lot of great stuff in, uh, in this piece on the lengths that Dublin players went to to get the best out of themselves. Like John Fogarty here then uh, goes into the, to the Pat Gilroy era. Uh, and again, just the, the second thing I want to mention here is that in the aftermath of the start of the Earwigs game against Kerry in 2009, he talks about how Gilroy punished himself for that. And I'm reading for, from John Fogarty's piece here. Uh, he recruited a performance and business consultant, Barrett McEnroe, who broke in claims, tore into Pat, saying he'd brought shame on his county for overseeing that disaster in Croker. You're only a novice, bluffer, choker. Your team can't tackle. You can't coach. You can't manage. He kept on abusing Pat and his team right until the, they were nose to nose and Pat eventually snapped and pinned him against the wall. Bart just smiled. Pat, look at yourself. You've allowed yourself to be emotionally hijacked again. Uh, and of course, Dublin had the last laugh. They didn't get emotionally hijacked in 2011 and they were all Ireland champions once again. So fascinating stuff uh, from Bernard Brogan in that one. Right, before we get to Stephen Doyle, uh, the mini documentary, The Long Road, produced by 20 by 20, will premiere at 8 o'clock tonight on the 20 by 20 Facebook page. It looks at the journey Irish female athletes have taken and towards the future of women's sport. Here's a taste of that piece, and Stephen Doyle is up next. Another letter. My main worry was the danger of injury, particularly to the breast. I felt that ladies would catch the ball into the chest rather than over their heads and that this constant trauma from a heavy football might have serious effect on breast tissue, even causing cancer. I would be reluctant to give my own daughter permission to play. Mm. What about that? Catch the ball when it's coming down the air and you've no fears. <laughs> There's only one other girl on the team. And that's all we really talked to. I'm Heidi and I'm 13. Yeah, make sure to check out the 20 by 20 Facebook page for that. Uh, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. It is 9.42 a.m. Stephen Doyle is with us. How are you getting on, Steve-O? I'm good, yeah. Thanks, Alan. Good morning. Good morning. So just a quick one in Ireland. We'll put maybe one or two questions to you here on this one. I guess overall, your final takeaways on the first weekend of the Stephen Kenny era. Um, my final takeaways uh, would be that I wouldn't be getting too worried or too concerned about the performances. Look, I was listening to um, Gary Breen and Kenny Cunningham on OTBAM yesterday, and I thought they really nailed all the points that they made about, you know, just the fact that the players are still in pre-season, that we're still trying out this new system under Stephen Kenny as well. Um, I would just hope that Stephen Kenny, when he's reflecting, because he did seem a bit downbeat, and that's just Stephen Kenny. I've seen him like that before um, when he's, he's maybe had defeats with Dundalk. But I just hope he doesn't feel too downbeat for too long and that, that he, as well, maybe doesn't, that he just holds his nerve and that he sticks with, what, with his good feeling and goes with what he thinks is the right thing to do. Um, my, my only kind of, um, I suppose, when you're looking at the system and, and wondering if you can tinker with that maybe for the Slovakia game, like I, I spoke to you guys before the match, uh, before the two matches, saying that he had used that 4-2-3-1 system 
with the under 21s. And I just maybe think, would it be sensible maybe just to tinker with the system a little bit and, and change from a 4 3 3 to the 4 2 3 1 and just to give the back four that little bit of extra protection with a couple of sitting midfielders, maybe James McCarthy and Jason Malumbi? Because um, I, I thought Malumbi did okay on his debut. I didn't think he, he played a bad match at all. And I think himself and James McCarthy could be uh, the, the key to that game in Slovakia. And James McCarthy as well, just lacking a bit of match practice and, and, and match fitness. And we know that he can be that defender who gets in there and breaks up attacks, wins the ball back and, and then sets Ireland off on the attack. So maybe that's something you can look at. Look, the other thing as well is it's just that, that, that glaring point of our two fullbacks are basically playing wingbacks at their clubs. And you, you'd wonder, are they really right for this system? Like Enda Stevens has been good for Ireland, there's no doubt, but he hasn't really maybe as played as well as he has for Sheffield United in the Premier League. And Matt Doherty definitely hasn't shown like he has for Wolves um, in this Irish team. So perhaps it's it's time for Seamus Coleman to come in at right back uh, for that game against Slovakia, um, horses for courses and all that kind of thing. And the other one thing I'd say as well, on about Shane Duffy, and I know Shane Duffy was slightly self-critical after the match, and I know a lot of people were wondering about his own performance. And you just have to look back at the amount of games that he played last. I was just looking for his, for Brighton last season. Like he made 19 Premier League appearances. That's half of Brighton's games in the Premier League last season. And out of those 19 matches, he only um, started and finished 12 of those games. He was an unused sub for 13 matches. Like that maybe would go to show or go to explain somewhat um, why Shane Duffy was a little bit off colour. He's not only in pre-season, but I just wonder about his own confidence as well, his own self-confidence. Has that taken a bit of a hit after the season that he had last season with Brighton? And you would just hope that now he's with Celtic, he's going to get regular games and that will help bring him on because I think he can be a key in our defence. I, I, I can remember that famous game where poor Shane ended up in hospital. Of course, he ruptured the liver, liver that time. The amateur game uh, under Giovanni Trapattonio was there. And the one thing that stood out to me about Shane Duffy that day was the first time he'd he played with the senior players in the international team. He's a real talker. He's a real shouter. And even at that young age, he was trying to organise the defence. And I think he could be a key man for Ireland uh, in the years years to come. Whatever happened in those last two games, we'll just scratch them off. Um, but I think himself and John Egan will, will be a, a really good centre pairing for us, um, for the Irish team. And just one other thing I'd say, is if he is going to stick with the 4 3 3 on, I just think the team needs a bit more time in the pitch together because... You know, if you look at the best part three trees out there, the likes of Liverpool, they're so compact. Those lines all stick together really close. And Ireland just weren't doing that. They were they were allowing gaps and spaces to move about. And I even said it to you guys before the match um, that the back four looked a little bit zigzag. It was a little bit over the, all over the place. And that needs to be sorted out. So, um, look, plenty of stuff for Stephen Kenny to think about over the coming days. But I just hope that he doesn't, uh, that he does hold his nerve and, and stick with what he believes in. Steve, just a, a very quick one on on the young players. I know you're a big fan of Jason Malumbi, and there have been some rumblings in the last few days that maybe he might prefer, or Stephen Kenny might prefer, someone like David McGoldrick over Adamida uh, for the Slovakia game, given the importance of it. But uh, do you think he he should uh, throw some of those young guys in at the deep end against Slovakia, or or, or go with the more established fa- uh, players? Yeah, well, Slovakia they're 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 not a great side at the moment. They're having their own problems. They drew one one with Israel last night. Lost there. Uh, a last-minute goal, um, an equaliser in that Nations League game. So we're not coming up a team against a team of huge quality. I don't think Adam Eda did too badly over those two games. I actually thought he showed some really good stuff against um, against Finland on the last day out. He made some good attacking runs himself with the ball. Um, he held up play very well. But I think if David McGoldrick gets off to a good start for Sheffield United... Um, in the Premier League this season. The one big issue for for Dave McGoldrick is scoring goals, and we know there was a lack of that for the Blades last season, so that is a concern. Um, I, I think that's I, I think that's going to be his biggest selection headache, Stephen Kenny, for this game, McGoldrick or Ida. Personally, I think for a big game like this, I probably would start McGoldrick just because he has the experience. He has scored big goals for us um, before. And I think with regards to Jason Malumbi, I Listen, he's played for Millwall. He's played in the Championship a full season. Millwall supporters all like him. They know their football and, and they think he's a quality player. And I think if he's got somebody experienced beside him like James McCarthy, I definitely would start Malumbi. Um, I think there might be an issue if you're starting too many of the younger players 
Um, you don't be bringing them all in at the same time for one big game like this. So perhaps maybe leaving Adamita on the bench and starting Malumbi might be the way to go. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. All right, time for Dilo Nodio. I signed for them after the Euros. And after my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Lots to get into this morning. We're starting with Manchester United because they are hoping to secure up to three more signings before the end of the summer transfer window. And Borussia Dortmund's England forward Jadon Sancho remains their top target, according to the Manchester Evening News. Now, Real Madrid manager Zinedine Zidane's ability to overhaul his squad is reliant on Manchester United acting on their interest in 31-year-old Welsh forward Gareth Bale, according to Marca, and representatives of Porto's 27-year-old Brazilian left-back Alex Tellez have flown to Manchester for talks with United. That is via Abola, via Metro. So, lots to unpick there. Stephen and Shane, I want your take on this, both of your takes on this. Uh, Stephen, first off, mm. what should Manchester United's top priorities be right now? A left-back. I, 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 we're reading this news about Alex Tellez, and I actually commentated on a couple of Porto games in Europe over the last couple of years, and he's definitely one of those players that stood out um, he's still only 27, so he's a good age. Um, I know people are kind of wondering, is he going to nudge maybe Luke Shaw or Brandon Williams out of the reckoning? I think Brandon Williams is Manchester United's best left back. I think he's a really, really solid, good player. Um, right now? Last season. Like, right now, He's yeah, ready to take over yeah, from Shaw? I, yeah, I think myself and Brian Kerr, I remember it stands out last season, did the game against Sheffield United. You might, might remember that match, it was 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Um, and United got absolutely savaged by Sheffield United in the first half. We're, we're lucky probably to go in only 1-0 down at half time. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer changed his formation that day to a back three to reflect the opposition. And he played um, Phil Jones on the left of that back three, which turned out to be the key um, disaster area for Manchester United that afternoon. And Luke Shaw had a really torrid time. Mm. And I thought it was only for the fact that Phil Jones was playing inside him. He was absolutely torn apart on that side but it wasn't his fault as I said it was, it was definitely because Phil Jones was leaving too many gaps between the two players and I thought Williams then responded really well because you might remember he scored a goal in that game to get United back on track and eventually they, they got the draw of it, even having gone in front uh, from behind and I just think it showed the character that Brandon Williams has and I think that's something that Luke Shaw lacks I've seen Luke Shaw in games just you know not saying tools down but he just I think when he's when when he's up against it, Luke Shaw isn't the kind of player that you want. He gets caught flat-footed. Um, he's he gets caught out of position. He leaves the centre halves maybe stranded at times. And I think if it was me anyway, and I'm not only Gunnar Solskjaer, but I would have Brandon Williams as my number one left back and Luke Shaw as his backup. But if they can get this guy, Alex Tellez, he scored 11 goals last season <clears throat> for Porto, and he got eight assists. It's not a bad tally for a left back. Now, granted, it is in the Portuguese league, and I don't want to seem kind of, you know, looking down my nose at the Portuguese league. It's a good league, but it's not as good as the Premier League, Bundesliga, or La Liga. So you would have to factor that factor that in. But a player at 27, if they can get a good deal for this Tellez guy, and perhaps maybe get a good transfer fee for Luke Shaw, then maybe that's the way they should be looking at it. Shane, what are you thinking if you're moving the pieces around on the chessboard that is Manchester United? What are you doing? Yeah, it it kind of gets complicated when you see lads like Chris Smalling and Marcus Rocco coming back from uh, from uh, their loan deals and, and sitting in the front of the car, smiling, coming into training. Marcus Rocco apparently tra uh, training two two times a day to really impress Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and lick up to the teacher a little bit. But I agree with Steve <laughs> and Brandon Williams. Brandon is a is a fantastic footballer. Um, I, I, Daniel Harris, I think, was speaking about Ethan Laird recently. That he's a young guy coming through and he made a couple of Europa League appearances last season. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement about him uh, in the United Academy. So uh, I think United played Liverpool in the Academy match, and, and this was a United Academy team that included Mason Greenwood, and they said that this Ethan Laird guy is just a notch mm -hmm. above. So uh, it's an interesting one, and uh, Diad up in Meccano mm -hmm. deal seems to have kind of uh, died out a little bit. There's no more talk about him. Uh, so the port, maybe the Porto deal with Patelez is, is, is where United go, but I don't like seeing them linked with the likes of Gareth Bale. I mean... This is mm. it, it. It gets a bit ridiculous. It, it it's classic United transfer sagas. You you see you see them linked with someone like Jadon Sancho, young, exciting talent, pretty expensive, but still someone who's going to improve United a lot. But then 
as that deal begins to die out, you, you kind of resort back to the likes of Gareth Bale. I don't know if that link is even serious. Uh, could they afford a six hundred thousand pound a week wages? Who knows? I don't know what the golf courses are like in and around Manchester, but you know that link is a bit ridiculous. Maybe Spurs is more of a, a place where he might end up under Mourinho. But I think Sancho has to be the number one target, and I agree with Steve. Brandon Williams is is excellent. Maybe a bit of competition for left back wouldn't be a bad thing. Let's move on to Liverpool mm. because Aston Villa want to sign twenty year old England youth international Rian Brewster for twenty million pounds, according to the Sun. Premier League clubs believe Brewster will be allowed to leave Liverpool this window, with Sheffield United and Crystal Palace also interested in the striker. Uh, there's no way, is there, potentially that they let him go, given the future upshoot that this guy has and how glowingly everybody speaks about him? Yeah, he's still only 20 years of age, mm. on, and he went on loan to Swansea last season, scored 10 goals in 20 appearances, which is... No mean feat for a young player in the championship uh, finding his way. I tell you, if Troy Parrott could do something like that with Millwall, we'd be pretty happy as Irish fans. So I think um, he, he, he was sent out alone by Jurgen Klopp, sent it to prove himself. I think he's done that. And if you look at the Liverpool forward line, you know, obviously their 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 main three strikers are Firmino, Mane, and Salah. Now, really, if you're going to play a forward line of three players, you need to have three backup players as well. They have Minamino who started to come good in pre-season for Liverpool. He's, he's playing really well because he never really got a chance to shine last season. He kind of brought in halfway through the season and um, it was hard for him to, I suppose, maybe slot into that team when it was purring um, like it was uh, on their way to winning that title. Um, and if you look at the backup players, they have there, Origi, Benamino, and they kind of need a third player, I think, because like last season, they obviously lost Mane for a while to injury. They lost Firmino for a little while as well to injury. So, I think having three backup forwards there isn't such a bad idea. Um, so I think to sell Rian Brewster, I, I don't think it would be a good idea. Um, if they want to put him out on loan, maybe to... Then again, if they if they put him out on loan and there's talk of perhaps Sheffield United or Aston Villa, do you really want to loan him out to one of your rivals and perhaps have him... I know he's he's not going to uh, play against Liverpool uh, during the season if he does go out loan to a Premier League side, but... Uh, you wouldn't really want to um, perhaps maybe making things awkward for you during the season. So I don't know. I don't think it would be such a bad idea to hold on to Rian Brewster for Jurgen Klopp and uh, perhaps maybe just to yeah give him a go this season. He did well at Swansea. He did what he was asked to do and uh, perhaps deserves his chance at Anfield this season. He's just sticking with Liverpool then and they're going to put both of these uh, together actually because they are basically very linked. So first of all, Gini Wijnaldum's move to Barcelona is increasingly likely. Uh, according to reports in Spain. And then second of all, according to reports in Germany, Barcelona are now interested in bringing Bayern Munich's Thiago Alcantara, a target of Liverpool, back to the club. How do you see this little jigsaw working? Is it a domino effect, basically? Will Barcelona go for one or the other and <coughs> Liverpool either keep Ronaldo or they go for Thiago? Are we at that point? Yeah, I, I, when the Van Alden stuff was going on, I'm kind of wondering, what's the attraction for a player like him to leave the Premier League champions um, and a, a side that are going to be competing for the Premier League again this season and for the Champions League as well. And what is the attraction of going to Barcelona, a team that's in total disarray, to play for a manager like Ronald Koeman, who, you know, he's hardly set the world alight. Um, he did he did okay at Southampton, but coming in, inheriting, inheriting a club that was really built by Pochettino at that stage. Um, and he had a disaster at Everton. He did, he did well in the Dutch league, obviously, with Asi and that kind of thing. But um, there's no real attraction to go and play for Barcelona, bar perhaps the money. You know, if they're going to pay him a good pay, give, give him a good paycheck for moving there. And then what's the other attraction? Well, it's playing alongside Lionel Messi. And for a while, that was looking like that wasn't going to be an attraction because it looked like he was going to move out. But Messi staying. So perhaps the fact that you're going to play alongside Lionel Messi, um, you're going to get a good paycheck. That might, but might be some, might be enough to lure Gini Van Alden to um, the camp now. And then Liverpool need to bring in a replacement because you look through the... Like, the, the one thing I'd say about Liverpool as well, Marco Grujic is a player who has been kind of keeping under the radar for the last while. Went on, hurt, went on loan to Hertha Berlin, but he's back at Liverpool and it looks like Klopp is going to give him... He said he was going to give him pre-season to, to, to show that uh, or prove his worth that he deserved a place in the squad for this season. And from what I've read... Um, in the in the papers over the last couple of weeks, well, it's gone a bit quiet. So it looks like Klopp is happy enough to hang on to Grujic. So is, is he good he's enough? a player that, um, well, it's, you know, he, he's done well at Hertha Berlin, and mm. they were willing to pay twenty million quid for him. 
um, if if he was up for sale this season. So I think as a backup player, he, he's he's definitely worth hanging on to. And, and Liverpool do have enough midfielders there to perhaps um, you know sort of make up for the loss of Final and going to Barcelona. And if Barcelona are willing to pay a decent transfer fee, like he's 31 now as well. So if they can get a decent transfer fee for him, why not let him go and perhaps then bring in uh, Alcantara? So mm. yeah, it's, there's there's a lot of things that need to happen for all these moves to to solid the place. But I think he's definitely a player by now. If I was a Liverpool supporter, he's an excellent player, look, yeah, and he would be a loss. But if you can get a decent transfer fee for him, bring in a player like Thiago Alcantara, I wouldn't be too upset. Uh, they say that Chelsea haven't won any trophies, but they've certainly won this transfer window. And they may be in the process of throwing it all away, or at least mm-hmm. undoing some of their good work, because, according to Calcio Mercato, Chelsea's France midfielder N'Golo Kante would be Inter Milan manager Antonio Conte's dream signing, but could cost up to £60 million. I'm seeing £60 million there, Steve-O, and I'm thinking to myself, you pay that for N'Golo Kante, and if you're Chelsea, you do not sell him for £60 million. This is a very clear-cut situation. Am I missing something? Um, N'Golo Kante is injury-prone now. True. He missed a lot of games last season and the season before. Um, Chelsea had to, you know, the, the, there was a lot of times where Frank Lampard had to change his team selections and was missing N'Golo Kante for big games. So if a team or a club is willing to pay £60 million for him now, I'd snap their hands off. I love N'Golo Kante. He's been one of my favourite players over the last couple of years. I thought he should have won Footballer of the Year the season that Leicester City won that title. I thought he was absolutely magnificent. He's won the World Cup. I, like, I love this guy. I love his attitude. Um, I think he's such, a, he's such a nice fella. He's so committed to the club that he plays for. And, you know, yeah, like he, he, he's definitely a player if he's fully fit. I definitely would not be selling. But the fact that he is injury prone now and Chelsea do have players there that can, that can slot in there and, mm. and, and do his job. And as well, they've got Billy Gilmore coming through now, um, a player who I know John Giles has spoken, spoke with great affection for over the last uh, few weeks on o- OTV. So um, they've got players is, there that can... Is not a situation where yeah. Billy Gilmore, beside N'Golo Kante, you, you give him the greatest possible mm-hmm. opportunity to flourish beside one of the great recent Premier League midfielders? Like, I get the fitness point. It is a good point. And if somebody's going to be crocked for mm. the next little while, of course you take 60 million quid for them. My opinion is based on the fact that N'Golo Kante might be able to sort his issues out. He's still in his 20s, let us not forget. Yeah, but it is. it seems to be a lot of muscle issues, doesn't it? Hamstrings mm. and calves and that kind of thing. And when, it, when a player at his age, you think he's 29 or 30 now, isn't he? So when you get to his age and you're having a lot of those recurring injuries, I think that's a big concern, you know? So unless Chelsea can start, I, I don't know if they've done... I know Ryan Giggs, for instance, uh, when he was having those kind of troubles at United, he started getting into yoga, and that definitely seemed to help him prolong his career. So maybe Chelsea are, are, are trying to do something like that. I haven't heard, but I, I would just be concerned that it's, it's a lot of muscle injuries. It's stuff that, that would really uh, hamper a player like his, him. He's, his, his game is built on mobility, his speed around the pitch, and able to you know put out fires and and uh, block up holes and defences. Um, so I just think it's a concern. I think if you can get that amount of money, and considering the mo- amount of money that Chelsea has spent, if they can get £60 million pounds for a player of 30 years of age, I-, I would snap the hand off the club who are offering it. We're finishing up this morning with an actual deal. 29-year-old James Rodriguez is a blue. Everton snapping him up for £22 million. Pounds. Is this a good move for Everton? Like, I mean, it's... Not really a lot of money in today's market. Again, somebody in their 20s who might have another bit of the juice left to squeeze. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Owen. He's going to sell a lot of damn jerseys. What mm. a beautiful face that man has. <laughs> you know, he reminds me of uh, he reminds me of Bohemian centre-half Rob Cornwall, who's uh, a brilliant player, but also wheeled out to model every single jersey that they release. And uh, by God, I tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't harm, harm sales at all. Uh, he doesn't Rodriguez, come with a jersey, though, is the only... Is, uh, like, I mean, that's you the can't problem, get his yeah, face. the most... Definitely the most handsome player I think that's in the Premier League now. If we're going to we're going to do a, a ranking of beautiful players, uh, he's going to come in at number one. But seriously, what a deal! I think I think this is a brilliant deal. Um, I think Rodriguez. I think when he went to Real Madrid, I, there was so much pressure on him from the Bernabeu um, because of his transfer fee, because of what he'd done with Colombia. And for some players maybe don't react to that very well. He did well when he went out and loaned to Bayern Munich. And look, to be honest, he didn't do too badly. 
at Real Madrid. I think his 85 appearances I have there, 29 goals. It's not a bad return. And he, his assist rate was pretty good as well. So I think the other thing as well, the big thing for Rodriguez is he's going to give competition to one of, I think, the most underperforming players at Everton, Gilfie Sigurdsson. That, that man just frustrates me so much. I like Gilfie Sigurdsson, he's such a talented player, but I've, I've been at Goodison Park, I've done games there, and my God, he would frustrate the hell out of you because, you know, the one thing Everton supports, all they ask for from their players is that they give 100%. They like combative players that get stuck in and really get in the, the face of the opposition. That's one thing that Gilfie Sigurdsson doesn't do. He can tend to go sleep for games, 10, 20 minute spells. And he's such a talent, like we know what he can do. Um, you know, regards to his creative play. So I think that's something Everton need badly, a, a good number 10 player, which James Rodriguez is. And I think if he just, if he can soak up the culture at Everton Football Club, and I'm sure Ancelotti will put that across to him, and I'm sure the other players there will, the likes of Seamus Coleman uh, will do that, and they'll tell him exactly what the, um, the supporters want at Goodison Park. Now, obviously, there's not going to be any supporters there for a while, but I'm sure... Um, I, I think this is a really good signing. For the, as you mentioned, all the, 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 the amount of money they paid for, I think it was 20 million pounds, 22 million euros. I think that's a really, really good deal. And bringing in Alan as well, who's going to be the more defensive midfielder behind him. Um, I think this Everton squad is shaping up to, to look really good. And um, I think Ancelotti is going to have them up in the top six anyway, and maybe right. perhaps competing for it. They could be a, a dark horse for a top four spot. Shane, what do you reckon? Yeah, what was the famous headline? The name's Bond, James Rodriguez, in the newspaper <laughs> that time. So I hope some of the newspapers go with that. But, I mean, Carlo Ancelotti is clearly a manager who who loves this guy. He, it's it's the equivalent of Harry Redknapp and Nico Cranshaw. He signs him for every club. I think this is the third time after Real Madrid and Bayern that they've been linked together. So it's an interesting one. And, and look, it's clearly the signing of the transfer window. It's the headline signing so far. And I think the smart one in this is that it's a two-year deal with the option of a third. You don't want to be stuck in a five-year contract with a player like... James Rodriguez, if it does go tits up, a la Falcao or Alexis Sanchez. So at least they have the option to get rid of him if it does go wrong, but it, it feels so right. That's great stuff. That is it for Deal or No Deal this morning. I signed for them after the Euros. And after my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? And that is our lot here on OTB AM this morning. A quick look at the OTB Sports Radio schedule today. At midday, we've got Quinny's How's the Head with Shane Carty. At one o'clock, OTB Gold focuses on the life and times of Johnny Kilban. At three o'clock, we are live with the Dadcast. From four o'clock then, we are revisiting the Mount Rushmore that went through South Dublin's best four sports people. And at six o'clock, it is OTB Gold, Barry Ryan, who is the author of the brilliant cycling book, The Ascent. OTBAM has been live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. If you don't have the OTB Sports app already, head on to your App Store or your Google Play Store to get that. We are back on air and online from 7 o'clock this evening, and OTBAM is back live from half past 7 tomorrow morning. We'll chat to you then. Bye-bye for now. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette. 